Punch out! Punch Out! It's just a small series in Nintendo's arsenal of games. You play as a tiny boxer named Little Mac, and you fight against the biggest beasts of men you've ever seen. But what drives Little Mac? What motivates him to join the WVBA? That's the West Virginia Broadcasters Association. That doesn't make any sense. It's actually the Washington Volleyball Academy. No? Actually, it's the World Video Boxing Association. Well, according to the various game guides, Little Mac is a very strong opportunist, and the WVBA is very beneficial to younger fighters. That, uh, that seems like a less than wholesome reason for a main character. Not really something you'd want to root for. It's like cheering for your favorite sports star after he purposely crippled his rival in order to face no competition. That's taking an opportunity, and likely he's too famous to face major consequences. Well, what I'm about to tell you may be the real reason. A reason that makes much more sense for a main protagonist to use as motivation. Punch-Out! Wii is nothing more than a metaphor taking place in the mind of Mac. But that doesn't mean that the game is only in Little Mac's mind, heavens no. Little Mac is still a boxer, he still trains, he still fights, and he still wins championships. The only thing that we aren't seeing are his actual fights. Allow me to explain. Look at all these fighters. Not a single one of them is a simple, down-to-earth boxer, like Little Mac. None of them are, quote-unquote, normal. All of them are extremes, extreme stereotypes, extreme character and personalities. If we put someone like Super Macho Man in an MMA fighting ring, his personality and fighting skills would surpass even Jean Jones. None of these fighters are actually what Little Mac is going up against. In reality, instead of fighting Disco Kid or King Hippo, he's fighting Basic Billy and Normal Boxer Norman. But why? Why is Mac imagining this stuff? Hallucinogens? Knocked into a coma? Is there something wrong with him? Yes, actually! I believe that Mac has all sorts of problems, and each one peeks up on him at a different point in his life. And that mental problem is represented in the form of his latest in-game opponent. So let's go through his opponents and find out which mental disorders they each represent. But first, let's look at Little Mac himself. Emphasis on little. Tiny. Minuscule. Twerp of a short person Mac. Mac doesn't ever... <clears throat> Mac doesn't ever speak. He doesn't even smile all that often outside of those rare moments of victory. Due to his height and size, he was most likely teased and bullied in high school, which he's just out of, by the way. He's 17. Yeah, 17 and that ripped. But sadly, this is often seen as overcompensation for one's height. But at the end of the day, it still leads to a sadly very common problem with many. Depressive Disorder. Depressive Disorder matches with his first opponent, Glass Joe, extremely well. Those with major Depressive Disorder have feelings of worthlessness and rarely ever exhibit pleasure, even in activities they once thought were great. Glass Joe barely ever fights, constantly asks for naps in between matches, and continues to threaten to retire. Another trait that he and Mac may share is his general anxiety disorder, which Glass Joe demonstrates by his fear of getting struck in the jaw. Mac needs to beat this mindset out of himself and take control of his life. And he does so. But then, even after battling depression, he comes up against... Von Kaiser and his acute stress disorder. Acute stress disorder is similar to post-traumatic stress disorder, though not quite as severe. In this game, it is extremely exaggerated and played for laughs. Von Kaiser has flashbacks to when he was humiliated in front of school children, and he worries that someone will find his weakness and expose it. Von Kaiser truly is a strong representation of acute stress and its effects that occur upon someone. Even if Little Mac has fought back his depression, there are still strong instances of acute stress in his life. Flashbacks. And Little Mac must learn how to fight this off as well, or else it will cause him to worry about his shortcomings and become distracted in his fight, just like Von Kaiser. After his two bouts, Little Mac comes to Disco Kid. Ready for this? Now we could mark DK down for ego dystonic sexual orientation. No, not you. Ooh, 
we should try to focus on a more possible disorder that Mac could be facing. ADHD comes to mind. Right after battling all these bouts with depression and acute stress, Mac would have a hard time concentrating on his fights. So Disco Kid is suddenly brought in with his constant dancing and believing he's more in a dance club than a fight. Disco Kid is made to teach Mac how to get back into the fight and keep his focus there. Here it comes. Oh! <laughs> because if he doesn't focus, he'll be destroyed. Now, Mac may have gotten a stronger hold on his life, no longer depressed or having random bouts of acute stress, and no longer being constantly distracted with ADHD. Mac begins to lighten up, or at least, heavy up. Mac becomes obsessed with protein in order to build his muscle and match the much stronger competitors. However, Mac can't handle the calories and must face with King Hippo, who does nothing but eat food all day. If Mac can't get a hold of his eating disorder, he will become fat, which in turn will cause him to be humiliated once again by his much fitter opponents. To prevent this, he and Doc Lewis, his coach, and possibly psychiatrist, start counting his calories and nutritional intake and Mac takes it religiously. Mac ceases his upcoming weight gain, but all of this attention to detail causes yet another problem. OCD. After eating all that food with such obsessive precision, Mac becomes a tad more paranoid and distracted. He focuses more on getting punch combos perfect, always thinking hard. This makes him victim to poor poker face. All that concentration and thinking inside of your head often will allow others to see what you are thinking through nonverbal communication, facial expressions. Enter Piston Hondo. Piston represents this same problem that Little Mac is constantly facing at this point. Piston, too, has poor poker face. His eyebrow raising gives away his next attack, every time. Little Mac must learn to defeat this habit in order to move on and become a Pokemon master. A, a poker face master. Poker face. And Little Mac does just so. However, somewhere in his career, Mac is becoming untrusting to anyone but Doc Lewis, leading him into a poor direction. He's becoming a misanthrope, someone that leads themselves away from all mankind, aside from having the occasional boxing match. Misanthropes and sports don't really connect, and the combination of these two things leads to Bear Hugger. Well, let's see now. I can't start until I find my little, uh, where, oh, here, I'm here, where are you? Where are you? There you are, you crazy little, <laughs> A misanthrope who was trained by a bear and a squirrel. Mac needs to fight off the urge of misanthropy and defeat Bear Hugger before he begins to act just like him. Unfortunately for Mac, fighting back all these problems isn't always easy. You often have to fight any recurring phases until you ultimately defeat that phase. Little Mac again defeated depression and had a rematch with acute stress. Now Little Mac has lived the life of a misanthrope boxer for a good period of time now and can't comprehend what's true in the world. Even his fighters start turning into strange hallucinations that mess with his mind before he can find the path back to normalcy. Little Mac has schizophrenia. Enter! Great Tiger, the disappearing, cloning boxer who uses his magician skills to fool Mac into attacking fake Great Tigers while the real ones clobber in. However, fighting back with his immense willpower, Mac eventually gets a hold upon his mind and KOs the metaphoric boxer, ending the tyranny of unhealthy mentalities that has plagued his mindset and just in time to become the number one contender for a major title. Little Mac has finally reached a standard mindset. He's normal now. But even those with normal minds may face some potential problems, mental problems that sneak up and prey upon the normal minds of successful individuals. My friends, let me introduce you to the Foolish Five. First, comes a fighter and fear that all fellows will eventually face. Mr. Gerontophobia, or as Mr. Nintendo likes to call him, Don Flamenco. Donnie is a gerontophobe. To the fullest extreme, the fear stems from his unfortunate case of premature baldness, which he covers up with a toupee. Because of this, he fears becoming older and staler and having those younger than him triumph over him. 
Donnie wants to remain an object of lust to women like Carmen. This is an incredibly common feeling for media stars, which Mac has now become. But Mac still has plenty of years left in him. He's only 17. It isn't healthy for him to think about this. He realizes this and defeats Don and moves on. But Mac slowly becomes bitter. After victory upon victory and claiming a major circuit title, his brain gets more full of itself and has him believe that he can do whatever he wants, including cheat. That's right. The reason Aaron Ryan has planted himself into Punch-Out! Wii is to illustrate Little Mac's conduct disorder. Bum, 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 dramatic reverb. Now, Mac probably isn't cheating as blatantly as Aaron Ryan is, mind you. He probably just forged some paperwork, failed a health test, and forged it to seem like he passed. But he seems really fit. Which health test could he have failed? We'll get to that in a second. Now, since we're mentioning the fighters brought in from Super Punch-Out, Bearhugger was clearly brought in for great marketing value and to establish Little Mac's misanthropy. But out of the rest, why Aaron Ryan? The answer is clear. The reason Little Mac has conduct disorder in the first place has to do with Aaron's home country. Ireland! Home of the wee leprechauns! Pale white warriors! Who'll kick your face off! And doesn't afraid of anything! And most of all... ALCOHOL! Part of this complete breakfast! And do you know what other country and fighter has a big alcohol kick? Russia! And Soda Popinski! Also known as Vodka Drunkinski. Aaron Ryan's placement was because of the parallels he has with Soda Popinski. Little Mac really had to defeat these two together. Soda Popinski's obvious drinking problem leads to the failed health tests and the conduct disorder of Aaron Ryan, making Mac a mess as he fights off two of the foolish five at once. Underage drinking and cheating while at the top. Thankfully, a couple of rehabilitation sessions and KOs later, Mac is back on his feet and ready to go back into the ring. But the media is not going to just let him walk away from that little bit of controversy he was eventually caught in. The media begins to hound on Mac and prey upon a huge disorder he's got. Social anxiety disorder. Think about Little Mac. He does nothing but hang out with Doc Lewis. He's never really been around too many people at once. And in Macho Man's... Oh yeah! I mean, in Super... Macho Man's <laughs> title montage, Little Mac can't really handle all the attention he's given, and now must brawl against becoming another fighter, Bald Bull. Bald Bull also has social anxiety, as seen in his montage, but in response, he shows off the mental disorder he represents, Intermittent Explosive Disorder, which basically is... <laughs> Little Mac must defeat Bald Bull by keeping control of his temper, not letting his anger get the best of him. If Little Mac can't defeat Bald Bull, then he may possibly become him. At this point of Little Mac's career, he's done a lot, beaten a lot of boxers on the inside of his head, and beaten a lot of boxers on the outside, in the real world, against real boxers. Little Mac couldn't make his feelings any clearer. He thinks he outclassed his opponent, and after that display, I might be inclined to agree. While he's experienced being full of himself before, he now finds it's even harder not to be. People look up to him, lust over him. He's gotten lots of promotional offers, lots of dough. He's so close to the top, only two more to go. But if he sets aside his training, it will all be for naught. He has no time to be full of himself, so he punches that narcissism that Super Macho Man represents right out of his head. And now... Little Mac has done it! He's battled through depression, fought to keep his body healthy, saved his mind from bouts of insanity, and has triumphed over the Foolish Five. But there's one more foe to beat. In this corner, it's Sandbag! Oh! I meant Sandman. Mr. Sandman, being the final boss, is the real kicker to this viewpoint of the game. Look at him. He clearly is the living, breathing, walking, talking version of an inferiority complex. 
Indeed, Mr. Sandman is nothing but a human inferiority complex. For Mac, it's even in his name, Mr. Sandman. Sandman is the one who puts you to sleep. Mac dreams of becoming this guy, but he'll never look like Sandman. Sandman is tall, dark, intimidating. Mac is short, paler, and while well, he's trying to look scary, you gotta, give, you gotta give him credit for trying. Sandman is Mac's final opponent because Mac needs to finally accept who he is. Little Mac is a great fighter going through tough times because of his various mental problems and inferiority. And the final step to accepting himself is to prove that he, Little Mac from Bronx, New York, is better than any fantasy he could ever have and has all the qualities of a boxing champion. Little Mac has gone through many obstacles, physical and psychological, to not only become the WVBA champion, but also to finally accept himself for who he is, flaws and all, and you, the player, also go through the thrills of Little Mac defeating his mental foes. You get to feel like Mac standing side by side with him as you face off against the obstacles that you too may have to fight later in life. And if you do find yourself fighting them, think like Little Mac. Admit the problem. Fight it. And punch it right in the jaw! But what about Smash Bros? What about the secret character of Donkey Kong? What about Little Mac's retirement? By the way, spoilers. Easy, easy, easy. All of that is still extremely relevant to Little Mac as a character and his history, but as far as the main campaign of the game, and thus as far as this theoretical view of it is concerned, Mac still gets up and dukes it out from time to time. Not only to remember the thrills of fighting, but also to look back and see how much stronger he has become. Physically and psychologically, Little Mac has proved that even though he's mental, He's still awesome, just like you at home. Samus has got a lot of stuff in her suit. That's... that's not what I mean. There we go! A lot of items and power-ups, jet boots, a hundred missiles, multiple blaster types, layers of armor, and generators! But out of everything, one of the most iconic abilities she has has got to be the ability to morph into a ball and roll around. But why not just crawl? Well, because crawling is significantly slower and clunkier, especially with that armor. Being able to turn yourself into a sphere almost instantly is actually quite beneficial. But how does she fit into that? And how does she control where she goes? Well, because if we applied real logic here, then this is how the game would begin. Now, there are other videos on the topic, namely this one, but I'm taking this in a different direction. The Morph Ball is not lame. It's sphering amazing! So let's get right down into it, shall we? Samus is six foot three, which is very tall for a woman. Or is it? The whole Metroid series is based in the future, right? And people who lived in the past were significantly shorter than we are today. As technology and quality of life advance, so are our human bodies. Generation after generation, we are getting taller and larger as a species. So by the time we reach Samus's birth year, 2055, perhaps six foot three will be the new norm. Though, also, Samus was raised by very tall bird people. 
who trained her to be strong and flexible. So that might have had something to do with it, I don't know. Either way, Samus is 6 foot 3 and weighs 198 pounds. Oh, by the way, that's 1.9 meters and 90 kilograms. When in the suit, Samus is raised about 2 inches, thanks to the top of the helmet and the bottom of the boots. So 6 foot 5. And let's focus primarily on Super Metroid, as it is the most iconic of the Metroids and has the smallest morph ball. Samus's sprite is 48 pixels tall, so 6 foot 5 divided by 48 tells us that each pixel is 1.6 inches, when in morph ball mode, she is only 16 pixels tall, which means she crouches down into 25.6 inches of space, 0.65 meters. Being that the morph ball is, well, just that, a ball, we can easily calculate the volume with this. Plugging in the number shows us that her morph ball is a tightly packed 8,784 cubic inches, 0.14 cubic meters. Now by itself, that doesn't seem too impressive. Daniel Browning Smith is the world record holder for the best contortionist. He earned the title when he fit himself into a box with a volume of 4,212 cubic inches, meaning less than half the size of the morph ball. Jeez! What's so morphy about it then? Fitting into this amount of space is not impressive really. Almost anyone can. What gives? Well, I'll tell you. Samus wears armor. Uh, well, well, duh. I don't see how that matter- Ew! You get it, don't you? This amount of space isn't just for Samus. It's for Samus and her armor. Looking at this volume and claiming that that's the amount of space Samus has for her body is preposterous. Her armor is thick, inches thick, everywhere. And now remember, her shoulders are freaking generators! Look at how thick the armor is around this area, and the helmet is twice as wide as her head. This is where the Morph Ball actually utilizes that Morph part of its name. The armor transforms and interlocks so that its outermost parts form a ball, but the inside is likely not so perfect. You can't transform a generator and have it still function as a generator. It has to look and work this way. Using these same measurements, her shoulders alone take up 1,098 cubic inches each. Then her head and helmet, which I sure hope isn't flexible, that'd be gross, takes up about 1,563 cubic inches. This means she now has to fit the rest of her body and all the additional armor in a space of 5,025 cubic inches, which is now a lot closer to the world record holder. Speaking of which, Daniel only stands at 5 foot 8 and is likely around 150 pounds, not the 6 foot 3 near 200 pounds of Samus. And she still has all that extra armor. Looking at it, parts of it are pretty tight, like at the joints, but other parts are multiple inches thick. Even just guessing that her armor is on average a mere inch and a half thick, guessing this number makes the math easy on ourselves since that's one pixel, would reduce the amount of space she has to fit herself by 2,414 cubic inches. Meaning now, just her body, her body from the neck down, has only 2,611 cubic inches to fit. In other words, the much larger body of Samus needs to fit into a space a little more than half of that as the most flexible human on Earth. Is that even possible? To answer that, I did some digging in the Googles and the Wolfram, and finally found a calculation that gives you an estimate of your volume. The first number is your weight in grams. If you don't know that off the top of your head, you can take your weight in pounds and multiply it by 453.6 to convert it. Using Samus's weight of 198 pounds gives us 89,812.8 grams. This is Samus's mass. The next step is incredibly easy. See, the human body has a density very similar to that of water. And since water is what we set the density standard as in the first place, we now divide your mass by one. Easy enough, right? This new number in cubic centimeters is your volume. Converting cubic centimeters to inches tells us the truth. The fate at hand. Can Samus actually fit herself into that morph ball? 2,611 cubic inches? <laughs> Heck no. She's 5,480 cubic inches. Even subtracting her head and helmet from that, like we did to get this number, still gives us about 3,917 cubic inches. And also remember, this is only assuming that her armor is an inch and a half thick. Many parts of it are obviously a lot thicker. 
such as her back and bust armor. So even if Samus melted her body down into a mushy puddle of human goop, it would still be impossible for her to fit her body into that small amount of space, which I suppose makes some sense when we look at this. Samus is curling up as much as she can while doing a flip in the air. And here is the Morph Ball. It's a lot smaller. Her armor simply isn't flexible enough without using some sort of morphing technology that both changes its own properties and that of Samus as well. There is much more than meets the eye when it comes to this thing. Transformers! So just how does it work and how does it transform so quickly? And how does she control it? That's a question for next time! So in the first part of this duology, we found that Samus's Morph Ball is physically impossible for a human of Samus's size to fit into. We took the size of the ball and figured out her size when curled up. And while she can curl her body up into a ball of that size, that's not taking into account all of the armor and the generators that have to fill all that space too, shrinking the remaining volume that's her space. Now I'll admit that I should have cleared that up a little bit more, there was some confusion in the comments about all that which I'll briefly clarify now. Though if you did understand what I mean when I said all that, then you can click here to skip ahead to where I continue the discussion. Basically, this confusion was caused by my not explaining my point well enough, I guess. No clear example given. Basically, some people were confused because her morph ball is her armor. Why would she need to fit herself and her armor in the morph ball then? if the Morph Ball is her armor. So I'll explain it a little clearer using a visual example. Let's imagine this beach ball. And now let's say this beach ball is the same size as the Morph Ball, meaning there should be enough space to fit this much air. Yes, but a beach ball is very thin plastic, but the Morph Ball is made of Samus's thick armor, which gets crazy thick at certain points. So let's take the beach ball and make the plastic thicker, but inwards because we can't make it thicker outwards, that would make the ball bigger than the Morph Ball. So as we add more and more plastic thickness, there becomes less and less space for the air inside, as is the case with the Morph Ball. We know how big it is on the outside, so all the added thickness from her armor has to be on the inside, lowering the amount of space she has to fit. So much so that even if we turn her into goo, she still couldn't fit. The Morph Ball is physically impossible. So now with that out of the way, let's move on with part two. How the Morph Ball actually does work. In Metroid Prime, throughout the game, you can read logs left behind by the space pirates. One of them reads, Science team is attempting to reverse engineer Samus Aran's arsenal, based off data acquired from her assault on our forces. Progress is slow, but steady. Command would dearly enjoy turning Aran's weapons against her. We believe we can implement beam weapon prototypes in three cycles. Aran's power suit technology remains a mystery, especially the curious morph ball function. All attempts at duplicating it have ended in disaster. Four test subjects were horribly broken and twisted when they engaged our morph ball prototypes. In other words, while the Space Pirates' most intelligent members are able to understand how to build Samus's weapon system, they've never been able to successfully create a Morph Ball suit. That is, at least not one that allows the wearer to survive. This is a key point in how the Morph Ball works. It's a mystery, even to this technologically advanced race. It's something that the Chozo managed to create, however. Pretty efficiently, too. So what makes the Chozo different from the Space Pirates? Well. The type of technology. The space pirates have technology based fully on physical science. Whereas the Chozo managed to advance their technology as far as possible with a mixture of science and spirituality. We don't know much about the Chozo. Their ways are shrouded in mystery. But we do know the Chozo are a more spiritual race which is evident in their ruins, plenty of shrines and temples, and they even managed to bring their spirits into our plane of existence just to defend them. Not to mention that during their last days before going extinct, they spent most of their time meditating and looking over other species to help them advance both technologically and spiritually. Going off on a tangent now, one of these species was of course humans, ancient humans. 
Looking at these Chozo ruins and Chozo hieroglyphs, it's apparent that the Chozo arrived on Earth at some point during the days of ancient Egypt. They taught the humans many things, both spiritual and scientific, possibly even all the basics, such as agriculture. The Egyptians were the first to farm, after all. And this assistance led the Egyptians to have two of their most important gods, Ra and Thoth, depicted as bird people, as that's what the Chozo are as well. Ra, the god of the sun and creation, and especially Thoth, the god of knowledge, magic, the arts, and science, the creator of language, mathematics, and he's the moon. Thoth is who mythologically gave humans the ability to meditate and advance spiritually, and even gave them systems of which to advance by their own means, such as language. Now replace Thoth, the god, with Thoth the Chozo, and things become clear. So now, I should have proven my point. The Chozo are not only technologically advanced, but spiritually as well. This is another key part in how the Morph Ball works. But now let's look at another thing, Samus's suit, which was built by the Chozo and is filled with its technology. However, when under mental stress, the suit is shown to start disappearing into thin air. This is because the power suit requires superhuman levels of concentration and mental determination to function properly. The only way Samus can keep it on without it vanishing is because she was raised and trained by the Chozo, both physically and spiritually. Lots of meditation through which Samus learned how to control her emotions and maintain the suit's use for long periods of time. Now, why would any super advanced piece of technology require such keen meditation to use, unless it in itself was made up of, or runs on, a kind of spiritual energy? which would also explain its vanishment seemingly into thin air. It's vanishing in the same way the Chozo ghosts do in Metroid Prime, in and out of our plane of existence. This would also explain how the suit transforms into the Morph Ball so quickly. Parts of it may phase through itself to get where it needs to be in time. But what does that say about Samus's body? Perhaps she can simply curl herself into a ball, and the bits of suit that wouldn't fit otherwise simply fade out of existence. While that is possible, Metroid Prime says otherwise. If you look at the Morph Ball here, you can see right through its center! There's just a bright, shiny light. There's no armor or even a Samus here. Wait a second. Metroid Prime is all in first person. Aside from the cutscenes, but, but during gameplay, it's always from the perspective of Samus. Meaning from the consciousness of Samus. But when she becomes a Morph Ball, the camera backs away to show the Morph Ball. Perhaps this is still from the viewpoint of Samus, or rather, her spirit, her consciousness, her body was turned into energy, and her soul, her mind's eye even, has backed off to help her see where she's going. The Morph Ball may truly be physically and scientifically impossible, but throwing in the spirit science of the Chozo explains everything. Here, we are getting a glimpse of Samus, under the armor, under her suit, under her skin, under all the flesh and bone. This is Samus's consciousness, her soul, her energy, who she is at the core. Well, talk about an out-of-body experience. Jeez. I really wish more people would play the Tales series. I mean, I guess the big turnoff is the cover art. People see the super anime art style and just assume that it's another Japanese RPG. Turn-based, slow, boring, about love and compassion and friendship, yada, yada, yada. Where's the guns? Where's the brown? Where's the gore? This series cover art doesn't exactly convey that the game deals with mass war, genocide of entire universes, the killing of a deity, racism, classism, ismism, but I digress. However, along with the cover art that doesn't exactly convey all the power behind each game, the titles are a little confusing too. What on earth is a Symphonia? What is a Zestiria? Well, allow me to explain the meaning behind each title. Some of the game titles do make a bit of sense, such as the first one, Tales of Fantasia. 
It turns out the game is based on an unreleased novel named Tale Fantasia. Fantasia is a play on the word Fantasia. You see, they just replaced the F with a PH! Because, you know, English being as weird as it is seems to think that P sounds the same as F. Fantasia has a few definitions, but the most fitting one is this, a work, most commonly a poem or a play, in which the author's fantasy wanders unrestricted. It can also mean something possessing grotesque, bizarre, or unreal qualities. In other words, Fantasia is a fancy way of saying fantasy. It's a fantasy game. It's, a, it's the tales of a fantasy game. Good to know they started off creatively. The next game was Tales of Destiny. It's the easiest of the bunch. It's about a group of characters that were all born, predetermined, predestined to meet their Sordians, which are sentient swords, and save the world. They all followed their destiny, and the game thus was called Tales of Destiny. Jeez, these first few were a lot simpler than they are today. The next one was called Tales of Eternia, because that's the name of the world they all inhabit. Eternia. But why is the world they live in called Eternia? Well, I guess by world, I more mean the name of their universe, their domain. Tales of Eternia is about two worlds, Celestia and Inferia. <laughs> Wait, say that again. Celestia, as in celestials, high beings, they live in the stars, they're amazing, and Inferia. The land Inferior. The root word is literally inferior. This world is literally named after it's not as goodness as the other world. Even the names of their governments is the Inferior Empire. The Inferior Government. But the plane of existence, the universe that they all live in, is all infinite and will last for an eternity, and thus is called Eternia. Then came Tales of Destiny 2, which is the sequel to the game where they followed their destiny. And now, we reach the confusing titles. Tales of Symphonia. But, but what's a Symphonia? Despite the name, this game has nothing to do with a symphony of instruments. But rather, it's about the idea of a symphony. A symphony is a beautiful masterpiece created by a large number of various instruments. The plot of the game is about a group of people from different walks of life going on a journey to restore the mana, the life energy of their world. But along the journey, they've... By the way, spoiler alert to, to all these. I might be a little late on that, but... Spoiler alert. But along the journey, they find out that replenishing their mana will cause the mana of a parallel world to drain. And that world will begin decaying away. But if they don't restore their own mana, then their world will decay away. As one world flows with mana, the other is in a drought. They are never balanced, never in harmony. So our heroes all join forces and do all they can to bring the two worlds into harmony with each other, blending the two worlds into one perfect balance, like a well-harmonized symphony. And then add an ia, symphonia, because that's what they do. Based on the name Tales of Rebirth, you might assume that the game has something to do with birthing, or baptism, or reincarnation. But no, there's none of that here. Instead, it's actually about a rebirth of culture and moral views. Here, the world is inhabited by two different groups, Humas and Gajumas. Back in ancient times, they were fine, but now they are extremely bigoted and racist against each other. But as the plot progresses and the heroes go on their journey, they look past their differences and are reborn as one solid people once again. Okay, Namco, I don't know what you're thinking anymore. Can you not think of another word that ends with Y and replace it with IA anymore? You're stuck using Legendia? Boss, I have the best idea for the title. Tales of the Legends. Mm, no, that's a bad idea. That's terrible. Where's the IA? This series, among many others, must be consumed by the Pac-Man. Nia. Pac-Mania. But... No, but... Make the title Tales of Legendia. But that's a little... Are you back-talking me, boy? Don't make me use the power pellet. Whoa, whoa, that's a good idea. You're always right, boss. Mm, yes. 
always right. Legendia, Legendia, the IA means nothing. This game is just about a group of people, both the protagonists and the antagonists, chasing various legends. It's the tales of the legends. Tales of the Abyss keeps it simple again, though. It's about an abyss underneath the planet that's all full of miasma. And as the strings of fate that the planet is bound by start to snap, so too does the balance of the planet over the miasma, and it begins to sink, falling into the abyss, both physically and spiritually. As the spiritual force that granted them guidance into a perfect future, a perfect fate, no longer applies, they now have no idea what the future holds. It's empty. It's an abyss. So even with the simpler title, you can still take it a step deeper. And it's, it's amazing. That's, that's a smart title. And that's also a really good Tales game. Tales of Innocence also has multiple meanings. For one, the plot takes place in a world that's in the middle of a world war that's affecting every part of the globe, except for a place called Regnum. It's at peace with everyone. They are innocent, but people with special powers start popping up here. As it turns out, they are reincarnations of the Devalokian, which are essentially evil demons. And even though they, in their current lives, are innocent, they are dealing with the repercussions of the things they did in their past lives. Vesperia, for Tales of Vesperia, is Latin for an evening star. And in game, it's the name of the brightest star in the sky. The protagonists here also form a guild. And guess what they call it? Vesperia, of course. Tales of Hearts, rather than being about organs that pump blood, is actually about the other kind of heart. I, I'm sure most people actually assume that. I'm just being funny. The word heart, as in your spirit, your emotions, and your soul. Kind of like in Kingdom Hearts. It takes place in a world where there are deadly monsters that eats people's spiria, their hearts. Kind of like Kingdom Hearts. There are also people with the ability to enter people's spiria, which is like a giant labyrinth. And these people can even move their spiria from person to person. Basically, the whole plot revolves around spiria which is basically someone's heart and soul. But what's with the R at the end of the title? Well, Tales of Hearts R is actually a remake of the original Tales of Hearts. Tales of Hearts was a Japan-only DS game, but later they remade it on the PlayStation Vita and released it worldwide, now known as Tales of Hearts R. Tales of Graces has a much more friendly atmosphere compared to the other Tales games, and the story heavily revolves around the power of friendship especially the friendship around Sophie. So grace here could be referring to the simple grace that is companionship, but I think there's more to it than that. Referring to someone as your grace often has to do with royalty and elegance, higher class. This particular group of protagonists includes a royal knight in training, a major in the military, a member of a prominent family, granddaughter of a butler, a veteran instructor of the knight academy, and the prince. Easily the most royal and upper-class group of protagonists from any Tales game. There is another meaning of graces, though. Forgiveness and blessings. In many ways, Sophie helped all of her friends, helped them grow, and learn to forgive one another. She was a blessing to them. But now, what about that F at the end of the title? Well, again, Tales of Graces was originally a Japan-only Wii game, but then was later remade on the PlayStation 3 and was labeled Tales of Graces F. The F stands for future. Don't ask me, ask Namco. Yeah. And now it's time for Tales of Zillia, the 13th main Tales game. There has been other Tales games, but they were all spin-offs. I need to make that clear. And I'm not the one making this up so that it fits my point or anything. It's officially, according to Namco, Tales of Zillia is the 13th game in the series. Yes. I'm not pulling strings. In Roman numerals, 13 is XIII. -I -I. Add IA to the end of that because Namco seems to like doing that with this series, and you've got Zillia. I sometimes look like L's when you put them in the right font. But that's not the only reason why Zillia is called that. The much bigger and important reason comes from Hideo Baba himself. He's the producer of the whole Tales franchise. Have you ever heard of the number Zillion? With a Z, not an X. Basically, it's a fictional number made up to 
get across the idea of a massive, uncountable amount of things. There's like a zillion people in the world. There's zillions of stars. You know, when you don't know the exact number, but you know it's insanely massive and very difficult to count, people just say zillion. Now take the word zillion, change the Z to an X, and change the end to IA, and you've got zillia. The reason the name is pulled from this massive fictional number is because the story revolves around the many, many events, people, and places you encounter throughout life, and the near limitless possibilities that they all include. And this makes even more sense when you include Tales of Zillia 2, the second Tales of Zillia game. In this game, the plot revolves heavily around multiverses or parallel universes, each one with a different possibility happening in it. And you go through destroying them, committing mass genocide on entire universes worth of people. And now we have Tales of Zestiria, a game whose main protagonist is extremely passionate about what he does. His passion is what drives him, but it is also what drives the antagonists. Ah, passion. Passion really is the spice of life, isn't it? It's so... just... zesty. I'm not even making that connection of thought up. That's what the creator himself said. They have a lot of fun with this series. But really now, you know your titles are confusing when the creator of them has to step up and explain what they all mean. Which... I'm sure, to some extent, does hurt the marketing a little bit in the Western world, along with the cover art. And I'm sure the next Tales game will be just as confusing, and we'll have to once again use our noggins to think up what the heck it means. Hello, Loxton here. Have you ever wondered what the titles of the Kingdom Hearts spin-off games are all about? What do they even mean? Oh, and just so you know, there will be some explaining of the plot of each game in order to explain the title meanings. So, you know... Spoilers! Kingdom Hearts! You know what I love about this series? Not only is it a Final Fantasy and Disney crossover... I mean, seriously, what kind of mind does it take to think of that? Other than, I guess, fanfiction writers. But it also has one of the most straightforward and to-the-point plots I've ever seen in a game. It involves next to no post-game research to understand. So why is it called Kingdom Hearts? Well, because in this universe, the heart of all the worlds is Kingdom Hearts. It is a source of great power and great wisdom, basically the heart of everything. Due to its power, many try to unlock it and gain access to its power. The nobodies of Organization 13 create their own Kingdom Hearts as well, and are growing it more and more to one day be able to unlock it and get their own hearts back. Think of your heart as your soul and emotions, your essence and all that. So that's the series as a whole. And Kingdom Hearts 2 and Kingdom Hearts 3, one of those titles should be pretty self-explanatory, don't you think? But there are a few spin-off games based during or between the main trilogy, and they have subtitles. Subtitles like this. What does that even mean? But let's go in order. Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep to start off. This game is based years before the main trilogy. It's a prequel, and thus, in a way, the birth of the series. Non-coincidentally, this game shares the name of the secret ending of Kingdom Hearts 2. When asked about it, Tetsuya Nomura, the director of the series, stated this, Honestly, I simply wanted to try using the word by. Ha ha ha. I thought game subtitles always have of or is, but you hardly ever see by. I asked the localization staff, and they said you don't really use it in titles. But according to a producer fluent in English, there wasn't a problem. So I thought it wouldn't be too odd to use it. Also, I thought it would be good to continue the flow of K-H-C-O-M and K-H-Coded, using internet words and keeping bonds between people in mind. I wanted it to be contracted to BBS, bulletin board system software that allows users to connect. Then I wanted to use the word sleep, and the result of all that was birth by sleep. Interesting. And speaking of KHCOM, Chain of Memories also has a 
title. It's based between 1 and 2. If you've played it, then the name should be pretty obvious. Here, you enter Castle Oblivion, where Organization 13 orders Naomine to manipulate Sora's memories, and as you go through the game, you begin gaining your memories back, and the people of the other worlds do as well. You are creating a metaphorical chain of memories. The PS2 version of the game has R-E colon at the beginning of it. Re. Because it's a remake of the original GBA version. And it's keeping with that internet theme that the director was going for, for whatever reason. Often, in online forums, R-E colon is a reply to something someone else said. Kingdom Hearts, 358 over 2... Di that's not right. No. 358 divided by two day no no this caused a lot of confusion back when it was first announced but the proper way of saying this title is kingdom hearts 358 days over two they could have just moved some of the numbers and words around and all this confusion would have not happened they didn't this game takes place during the ending events of kingdom hearts 1 chain of memories and ends at the same time Kingdom Hearts 2 begins. But it all takes place from another perspective, that of Roxas. Sora's nobody. But this doesn't explain the wonky mouthful of a title. So what does explain it all? Well, it all goes back, or rather forward, to Kingdom Hearts 2. At the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 2, you play as Roxas as well, but only for a one-week period, seven days. Roxas was part of Organization 13 for one solid year, which is 365 days. Subtract the seven days you play as him in Kingdom Hearts 2, and you are left with 358 remaining days that Roxas was in Organization 13. Okay, as convoluted as that is, that does explain the first number, but not the two, or the over two. So what's that all about? Well, in this game, you not only play as Roxas, but as Xion. Over 2 also often means divided by 2. And since you play as two characters, you play through those 358 days divided between two people. 358 days over 2. Easily the most convoluted title of any game I've seen. Seriously, why? Kingdom Hearts coded, or recoded, again, the re is just because this is a remake of a Japan-only cell phone game. Here you play as a post-Kingdom Hearts 2 Sora going through a virtual reality system through virtual worlds. Everyone you meet is digital. You fight digital monsters. Digital Heartless, and being digital means it's all made of code. It's coded. Ha! <laughs> Kingdom Hearts 3D, Dream Drop Distance. It's a 3DS exclusive, so you know, it has to have 3D in there. Dream Drop Distance takes place after the events of Coded, and in it, all of the worlds are in a deep sleep, thus are dreaming. They are also now vastly disconnected from one another. They're distant. And in game, you play as both Sora and Riku in what's called the drop system, and there's a drop gauge that gradually drops, thus, thus the drop. Really though, they just needed to find three words that started with the letter D, and base the title off that, because 3D, it's a pun. Quite funny! <laughs> now you may think that's all of the Kingdom Hearts games, but you'd be wrong, because there is one more, it's just, it's still a Japan exclusive, and it looks like it will actually never not be a Japan exclusive. It's called Kingdom Hearts X, or Kingdom Hearts G, or Kingdom Hearts X G. Hmm. It's a browser based, free to play RPG. It takes place way, way in the past of even birth by sleep during the Great Keyblade War where there were thousands of Keyblade wielders. These Keyblade wielders are all after what's called the X-Blade. And that's why Kingdom Hearts X is called Kingdom Hearts X. But the X-Blade is capable of opening up Kingdom Hearts and giving all of its power to the wielder. And there you go. All the wonky Kingdom Hearts spin-off titles explained. So, the more you know. Do you think they'll make more after three? I, I, I know they will and they're gonna be based after 3 most likely. Or during 3, but from the perspective of someone else. It's 
bound to happen. Sometimes game developers hide little Easter eggs and references to other games they have made in years past. Most of the time, it's just that, an Easter egg. But sometimes they are more than mere eggs. Let's look and find the hidden lore of Half-Life. In the Valve-developed game Half-Life, you play as a scientist, Gordon Freeman, working for a tech-developing company called Black Mesa. Meanwhile, in another of Valve's games, Portal, you play as Chell, a human lab rat running through what remains of the labs of another tech-developing company, Aperture Science. Looking through various windows will reveal meeting rooms with projectors still displaying their PowerPoint presentations. And many of them talk about Aperture's main competitor, Black Mesa. Indeed, Black Mesa and Aperture Science reference each other quite frequently, as they are always competing to be the number one company in the field of science. Black Mesa can eat my bankrupt- Sir, the testing? Right. Back in Half-Life, even, you learn of a ship called the Borealis, which has Aperture Science's logo on the front. The connection is clear. Portal and Half-Life are in the same world, and thus share the same lore. Sometimes, game developers hide little Easter eggs and references to other games they have made in years past. Most of the time, that's the end of that. But sometimes, they are more than mere eggs. Let's find the hidden lore in Left 4 Dead. Left 4 Dead is a game that takes you through the lives of a group of survivors, making their way to a safe haven in this post-apocalyptic, zombie-filled eastern United States. But what actually caused the zombie outbreak? Well, the game never actually says. You are too focused on surviving to care anyway, so this bit of lore is hidden. But I've got a theory. The answer is in Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike, another Valve-developed game, is about terrorists attempting to cause terror and anti-terrorists trying to anti-them. Players play on both sides and compete, so sometimes the terrorists actually win. And now, look at these screenshots. On one side you have scenes from Left 4 Dead, on the other, Counter-Strike. It's possible that Left 4 Dead is based in the future of the events of Counter-Strike. After all, what's one of the most feared types of terrorism? Bioterrorism. Extremists get their hands on bioweapon engineers and have them genetically modify a disease and place it into a bomb. The terrorists then plant the bomb in Philadelphia, which Left 4 Dead seems to hint at as being the place the zombie outbreak started. If a terrorist wanted to destroy America, it's pretty symbolic to start in a city that has many symbols of American history inside of it. So the terrorists win, the bomb with the zombie virus explodes, and the zombie outbreak begins. As the survivors travel, they stumble across some areas that were once seen back in the past in Counter-Strike. And that is Left 4 Dead's hidden lore. Sometimes, game developers hide little Easter eggs and references to other games they have made in years past. Most of the time, that's the end of that. But sometimes, they are more than mere eggs. And sometimes, the developer just comes out and says, Oh yeah, these two games, they fit together hand in hand. Such is the case with EVE Online and Dust514. Anyone who plays these games knows this already. But for those of us who don't, this is one of the most interesting game connections I've ever seen. Each game shares the same backstory and lore, but you wouldn't know that just from looking at the two games separately, so it's hidden enough. First, I'll explain EVE Online. A good explanation of this would take about an hour. So here's a absolute very basic foundation of descriptions. First off, largest video game universe, period. Based in the distant future, MMO. Emphasis on that first M, this game is massive and complex. The players run just about everything, and it has one of the most dedicated fan bases I've ever seen. In it, players command entire fleets, or manage entire cities. Everything is in large scale. You may recall a news story about gaming's greatest battle. One player accidentally drifted into the wrong space, and after being warned to leave, he didn't, and was attacked. His side came to defend him, and then the other side came to defend them. Eventually, this is what the map looked like. Crazy! And about 300,000 real US dollars was lost in this war. That's the scale this game plays at. As the players of EVE manage the galaxy, they need to occasionally hire mercenaries to do their groundwork. That groundwork comes in the form of an entirely different game. Dust 514 
Here you play as a mercenary, hired by a player in EVE to do something. Whether or not the mission is completed and how well it is completed will affect the overall balance of EVE and Dust's economy. In Dust, you can directly talk to the ships above the planet, being controlled by EVE players. You can ask them for airstrikes, which may be a difficult task for them to do if they too are having a war above the planet. Even all of the money you spend on microtransactions in Dust affects the EVE economy. This connection runs deep and true. It may not be the most hidden connection of lore, but it is definitely one of the most interesting. Mario. Luigi's Mansion wasn't exactly the best launch title. I mean, it was fun and atmospheric, but it was short yet still repetitive. Well, personally, I loved it. But what if I told you that this game holds the key to one of the Mario series' darkest secrets. Bowser is possessed. Mario! Haunted houses have been a thing in the Mario series since Super Mario Bros. 3. And in this game, as well as Super Mario World, the booze in them aren't necessarily bad guys. Mario here is invading their house and wreaking havoc among them. They clearly aren't well-trained soldiers of the dead. They cower in fear whenever Mario looks in their general direction. They just want him gone, out of their house. So they sneak up on him in an attempt to scare him away. But they still can't get over this fear of him. Mario messed up their plans for a peaceful afterlife, and the brave King Boo would have none of that. So eventually, King Boo managed to kidnap Mario himself. <laughs> Not to try and take over the Mushroom Kingdom or anything, but simply to get revenge on Mario and stop him from scaring his fellow Boos in the future. But what does a fancy boo with a hat gotta do with Bowser? Well, it's established in many Mario games that boos can not only possess objects, but also other intelligent living creatures. Take this minigame in Mario Party DS for instance. Boo Tag. If these regular boos can possess our heroes just enough to make them dizzy, surely the vastly more powerful King Boo can manage full possession at least of a corpse. But then, how did Bowser die? As any fan of the Mario franchise will tell you, Bowser seems to die a lot. But he keeps managing to come back. He falls into lava. A lot. But then all it takes is some magic, and BOOM! He's alive again. Lava mustn't do too much damage to Bowser. I mean, when he's huge, Bowser can just walk in lava just fine. And there are even times when Kamek isn't there to revive him, pull him out from the lava, and Bowser still manages to crawl his way out. But now, looking at Paper Mario, the game before Luigi's Mansion, Bowser is defeated by falling from a very high distance, above the clouds even. And afterwards, this is the one time in a Mario game that it is actually stated that Bowser is very likely dead, badly beaten, and will likely never return, as it says. But the issue with this is that the Mario series has no set canon, no set timeline, and a world being made of paper is very different from the traditional world Mario inhabits. Plus, in Luigi's Mansion, the ghost of Neville is reading a book. Looking closely, the title of the book is Mario's Story, which just so happens to be the Japanese title for the game, Paper Mario. It would make sense that the events of Paper Mario would take place in a book, possibly a fictional book, a made-up story about the famous Mario, or perhaps it's a retelling of an actual event that happened in the past. Mario's great story about how he finally defeated Bowser for good. But either way, the Paper Mario connection seems a bit loose, wouldn't you think? Like an old book. So how else would Bowser's actual death be explained? Well, it would have to be something quite more devastating than lava or a big fall. Like... 
A supernova, perhaps? Or falling into a black hole? Both of these would kill anyone and destroy anything. There's no way Bowser could survive. Granted, both Mario Galaxies did come out years after Luigi's Mansion, but as I said before, the Mario series doesn't have a set timeline. So this, being part of the timeline, is entirely possible. After all, they are still making games based early on in the timeline. Yoshi's New Island, for instance. So let's say Bowser did in fact die in Mario Galaxy 1 or 2. King Boo, being an all-powerful spirit, pieces his body back together, or even just summons it, before reanimating it with his own spirit, possessing it. It's also possible that this summoning of Bowser's corpse also reincarnated Bowser, and thus led to this confrontation we see in a painting. But Bowser's spirit is weak from being pulled back from the afterlife. This makes him easily possessed by Boo. You could even say King Boo removed Bowser's spirit and trapped it in this painting before planting himself in Bowser's beaten body. We know, thanks to the end boss of Luigi's Mansion, that King Boo is in fact possessing Bowser's body, though some refer to this as a Bowser suit, or a Bowser mech. Possible, but compared to every other mech or bot we see in the Mario franchise, this is by far the most lifelike. And one huge chunk of evidence is found when talking to the fortune teller, who not only sees Bowser somewhere in the mansion, and is surprised because previously Mario soundly defeated him, but she also says, Has King Boo somehow revived Bowser? <laughs> it's clear to me now, King Boo did indeed revive the soundly defeated Bowser, trapped his soul in a painting, and possessed his corpse. And before you assume otherwise, because Bowser here removes his head, ghosts and the undead remove their body parts and reattach them all the time. Like in all these examples I'm showing you right now. Now, this could also explain why Bowser is so resilient in later games. Stronger, harder to kill, because he is already dead. His body is merely being possessed. This would also explain Dry Bowser. Think about it. Dry Bowser is fully hollow, just bones. Skeletons on their own cannot move without some sort of muscles or some sort of supernatural ability. Such as being possessed. After having all of the flesh melted off of his corpse, King Boo still retains possession over the Koopa King. The same could be said of dry bones. They still fall apart when jumped on, because being jumped on causes fear in the normal Boos, or simply spirits, that are possessing the Koopa skeletons. The spirits briefly leave before repossessing it, of course. So, from the point of Luigi's Mansion forward, we may no longer be facing the original Bowser we fell in love with. We may instead be facing King Boo in Bowser's body, the true Mario villain. Until, at some point, Kamek catches on and magically revives him again, booting out Boo. Later though, King Boo and Bowser work together like in Super Princess Peach, and such. So tell me, what do you think? Use your heads. Does this change your perspective of Bowser? And how would you go about ordering the Mario games into a timeline? I think I'll talk about that in the future. In the present, though, you continue being awesome. And continue using your heads. Mario games and plot. Mario games, plot. Two things that are rarely seen together, like Thor and a barber or horror movies, and common sense. Are you crazy? The tide behind the chainsaws. In basically every Mario game ever, Bowser kidnaps Peach, and Mario is the only hope she has of being saved. I mean, Luigi's there too, but, you know, it ain't as much about length as it is girth, you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Bowser's basic motivation for kidnapping Peach is to use her as a hostage, 
or take her as a bride, or something along those lines, and gain control of the Mushroom Kingdom. It's a simple, exquisite, and basic idea, good for a simple story. But now in 3D world, he's capturing fairies by shoving them in bottles. Who taught him that? Link! Link! Get in here! I told you not to converse with that guy. He's a very bad man. You understand? Good. Now here's a sword. Go slay Ganon. In case you're unfamiliar with the... Uh, the plot of Mario 3D World, basically, it's this. Mario and the gang are walking. Whoa! It's a broken pipe. It's clear. Odd, but let's actually do plumber things for the first time in 20 years. Whoa! A fairy! Whoa! A Bowser! How does he fit in that? Oh, and he's gone. Along with the fairy. Which are called Sprixies, by the way. And thus Mario and the gang decide to go stop Bowser. The crystal pipe sends them to the Sprixie Kingdom. And thus, the adventure begins! You travel through various lands in this kingdom, and at each castle, you save a Sprixie, which then magically constructs a pipe to the next land. You finally get to Bowser, and you stop him, freeing the last Sprixie. And that's the plot. But now the question is, why? Why does Bowser suddenly stop wreaking havoc on Peach and the Mushroom Kingdom? What makes this distant Sprixie Kingdom and the fairies who reside in it worth his time? The easy answer is that this is just another kingdom to take over on his quest for world domination. Yes! And capturing the Sprixies is the first step in taking over their kingdom. But Bowser can be cunning, so it's not in his character to be so simply minded. We must keep in mind that all of these games are told from the Mario Brothers perspective, and thus put them in the spotlight and treat them as great heroes, and portray Bowser as a mindless meanie. Meanie weenie bobini. However, even with this intentional bias and deception in favor of the Mario Bros, it is possible to catch a glimpse of Bowser's true motives. Just because Bowser is a bad guy doesn't necessarily mean every decision he makes is a decision towards villainy. After all, Bowser was directly involved in saving the Mushroom Kingdom and Star Road during the events of Super Mario RPG, as well as defeating Fawful during Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story. And he doesn't mind putting down his quest for domination for a round of golf now and then. Sometimes, even capturing Peach was likely done with good intentions. In Super Mario Sunshine, he does so because he wants his son to think he has a mother. So it's possible that his motives in 3D World, from his perspective, were in fact good. Altruistic. Let's consider what's unique about the Sprixies. When everyone is rescued, they are shown to be able to build crystal pipes out of thin air in mere seconds. While it's unclear if they can only build crystal pipes or not, one would think that since they can, they could also magically build other things. Upon learning of this magical ability, Bowser captured the Sprixies to harness their powers. Sure, he probably could have just asked them for help, or paid them with his obvious vast riches, but Bowser isn't exactly known for his social skills. But what would Bowser want to build? Well, castles, obviously. Bowser clearly has a thing for castles, and somehow manages to have multiple brand new castles built for his minions in every game. Not to mention that his own castle is beyond massive. Problem is, castles aren't cheap. And even if he builds them with slave labor, they can take a while to build. Keeping Sprixies on staff would make castle building a cinch. But now you're probably wondering how this is altruistic. Well, the answer is that Bowser no longer has to capture Peach and steal her castle, or any other occupied castles, ever again. Since he can now build his own in a totally separate kingdom, no less. Furthermore, going by percentage, very few of Bowser's castles are actually built for himself. Instead, he can now reward his loyal followers with their very own castles. But that's not all. Near the end of 3D World, we see that Bowser has also built a large amusement park. Seriously, it's an amusement park. 
What could be more fun, happy, and non-evil than that? Bowser just wants to reward his friends and family with a fun place to hang out, giving them a big thank you. Until Mario has to come in all Mussolini style and ruin everything again, what a jerk. And that's the theory. A more thought out plot and reasoning to Bowser, besides he's a bad guy because he's a bad guy kind of plot that Mario games typically have. Bowser may be a socially awkward bully, but deep down, he just wants what's best for his fellow Koopas. Disclaimer! Viewer discretion is advised. This video features sexualized animals. Features is not the right word, but you know what I mean. This video talks about sex, fetishism, pornography, all that stuff. So if you're not comfortable with it, then go watch this instead. Furries! Love them? Hate them? Indifferent? No matter what your opinion of them is, and no matter if you are one or not, you have to admit that from the outside looking in, the furry community is... different. But I mean, that can be said of most subcultures. But many people, both in this subculture and outside of it, all wonder, why? Why does this particular subculture exist? What's going on in the psyche of its members to make them feel this way towards anthropomorphized animals? And I'm being serious. This is in no way a joke. This is a factual and in-depth look at why being furry is a thing. No, no, really. Really serious. I mean, no offense to anyone. And if I offend anyone, well, I'm sorry, that wasn't my intent. You need to grow thicker skin. First, I gotta say, finding reliable sources based on facts rather than the opinions of overly concerned conservative housewives was very challenging. More challenging than you'd think. And you probably think it's challenging already, don't you? Furries get a lot of hate and a lot of spread misinformation about them. Think, think gamers on mainstream news, especially Fox News. Think that, only more. So before we go into the why or the how, we first need to know what exactly it is we're talking about. The term furry can apply to both the anthropomorphized animals found in media themselves, but it can also refer to the real world individuals who are huge fans of them, dress up like them, etc. And speaking of media furries, you could say that it all started in ancient Egypt with their gods. You, you could say that, but I'm not going to because that's silly. Furries of both types are actually fairly modern. It wasn't until the 20th century that comics and cartoons would start depicting animals as characters, and eventually anthropomorphized ones. The intent was never to appeal to real-world furries, because for the most part, they didn't exist yet. The reason the artists chose animals instead of people is because animals are a lot more appealing to their target audience, young children. And it also helped differ their media from others making it more memorable. Hey, do you remember that one game, uh, what's it called? It has the dude with short brown hair and stubble, and he's an action star, and he's like in his mid-thirties. Uh, I'm trying to think, let's see. I don't, uh... Oh, what was that one game with the, the, like, the fox that flew planes? Oh, Star Fox! Do you remember that game with the, like, there's a fast fox and a fast hedgehog? And he's blue. Do you mean Sonic the Hedgehog? What's, what's that one stealth game with a raccoon and a turtle? Oh, Sly Cooper! Ah, do you remember that one cartoon? It had, like, anthropomorphic cats that were super, like, lightning cats or something? Hmm, Thundercats? Thundercats! We could have just a bunch of shows and games with similar art styles and only humans, but then everything starts looking samey, generic, less memorable. There are only so many combinations of human you can come up with, but throwing in animals? That gives you a lot more options at keeping your characters more original and memorable. Plus, it's more aesthetically intriguing to children. 
the brighter colors and the zigzags of the fur, and the vast differences in face shape, you can even make more varied merchandise of these cartoon characters. Because really, that's what old cartoons were. They were nothing but a marketing ploy. Sell advertising space and merchandise. Kids were growing up with this, and they loved it. Which makes sense, given that children were the target audience. Until the likes of Fritz the Cat. Fritz the Cat took anthropomorphized animals and put them in the mid of the sexual revolution, the late 60s and early 70s. It was a cartoon for adults, and I don't mean the kind of adult cartoons as in the things you find on Adult Swim on Cartoon Network. No, I mean, it was for adults. There's sex, and racism, and classism, and deep meaning, and sex everywhere. And this depiction of anthropomorphized animals didn't stop there. In the early 80s, the Bizarre Sex series, which was a series of erotica, had an issue featuring anthropomorphized cats. While anthropomorphized animals in the adult world was a rarity, when it came to children's media, it just wouldn't stop growing. And by the mid-90s, most cartoons featured anthropomorphized animals. At this point in time, furries did begin to pop up here and there, but they were very spread out, and would only really meet at sci-fi conventions and comic cons. It wasn't until 1989 that the first full-on furry convention was held. But then came the aughts. The birth of the internet. Mainstream, and the internet's been around for a while, but the birth of the mainstream internet. And thus, the furry revolution began! <laughs> With this furry revolution, more furries came to realize that they weren't as alone in their feelings as they thought they were. There are plethoras of others that share their interests. So, they began sharing their artwork and organized even more and bigger social gatherings. So now you know why furries exist in media and the history of human furries, which, again, are just people who really, really happen to like this art style, this anthropomorphized animal choice. Most people tend to grow out of it by the time they reach an adult age. Others don't. Nothing wrong with that. And others grow into it. Some really into it. I mean, really, really into it. I'm talking about furry fetishism now. The sexualization of anthropomorphized animals. But whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not saying all furries do this. That is a misconception. Let's cover some misconceptions. One of the biggest misconceptions that people have when a furry tells them of their furriness is that, well, Let's just say they assume you spend most of your time on DeviantArt with the adult filter off. But is that a fair assumption? Well, let's look at the numbers. Which, by the way, are the averages of a plethora of studies taken at furry conventions. So, that's as specific of a survey as you can get. According to the stereotype, all furries feel sexual attraction to anthropomorphized animals. But the fact is, only 37% say they do. 38% have mixed feelings and are more neutral, and the remaining 24% said they have no sexual attraction. They like furries for the design aspect, the community, or other reasons. Getting a little more into it, one study in 2008 found that just under 17% of furries were actually interested in zoophilia. Zoophilia meaning they actually want to have sexual relations with not just an anthropomorphized animal, but full-on, your cat. What are you doing with your friends? This has its own set of morality that I'm not even going to bother getting into, but it does show that the stereotype that all furries want to have sex with animals is blatantly wrong. There is one stereotype that does hold a little bit of truth, however. And that's that furries tend to lean a little more onto the homosexual side of things. Now, of course it's not true as a blanket statement. Blanket statements are never true. But let's look at the numbers. In the US, about 1.8% of people are bisexual and 1.7% homosexual. And these studies at these furry conventions show that these sexualities are overrepresented within this fandom. 
Averaging out the results shows that 23% of furries are homosexual, 41% are bisexual, and 32% are heterosexual. And 4% are... other. But in the end, the misconceptions found in media about furries is that they all wear fursuits, go to these furry conventions to do sex things with other people of the same gender, and animals. And that's simply not true, for the most part. So now that that's all out of the way, let's talk about why you clicked on this video in the first place. To find out why people are furries. How do they become this way? Well, I'll just say it again. For that 24 plus percent that doesn't feel any sexual feelings towards them, they're just in it for the design aspect. They happen to really like the idea of anthropomorphized animals. And they like participating in the community. But let's be honest now. Most of you probably clicked this video to find out about that other 37 plus percent. How do people find anthropomorphized animals sexy? And that is a question that is a lot more tricky to answer. How do humans that are supposed to find things like this, ah, ah, no, ah, no, this, there we go, mm, find themselves attracted to this as well? Well, there is one word that summarizes it all very well. Fetish. The sexualization of things that are not inherently sexual. There is nothing sexual about feet, yet it is the most common fetish in the world. Teachers? Latex? These are all non-sexual things that a lot of people find sexually attractive. So it's a fetish. Anthropomorphized animals, or furries, fall into this category too. They are not inherently human sexualized organs. Yet, just like feet, underwear, and nuns, many people do. So to understand the furry fetish and how it develops in someone, we first need to understand how fetishes in general develop. And being that this involves the long-term development of psychological and neurological sides of your persona, it's very complicated. Complicated and no one knows exactly why we do. But there are some good theories. The theory that makes the most sense to me when taking furries into context is this one. Fetishes begin developing in your childhood, usually before or just as puberty starts. And some event or string of events causes your still developing brain to make certain connections. As you begin to feel sexual feelings for the first time, certain things may leave imprints on your mind. Contexts that this thing means sex, sex makes you happy, so this thing makes you happy. Maybe it would be best if I explained with an example. Let's say a young boy has an older sister in her teens. Over the years, he's seen her go through puberty and become a young woman, and an attractive one at that. He sees many things, like her trips to and from the shower, or her underwear on the floor. At first, He's too young to really think much of it, but eventually, as his sexual side starts developing, his sister becomes the only thing that he really understands as sexually attractive. And he may wind up with an incest fetish. Or remember when I mentioned her underwear on the floor? In combination of that and the Victoria's Secret posters all over the inside of the mall, he may make the connection that the reason these images are arousing is not because of the mostly naked women on them. After all, he's seen fully naked women before and felt nothing, because that was before puberty kicked in. So it must be because of the lingerie. And thus, a lingerie fetish they develop. All because his developing brain made that connection. Think back to the first time you saw a naked or mostly naked person of the opposite sex, and it actually mattered to you. Or perhaps even the first time you felt this new feeling of arousal. A lot of people can remember that moment in their childhood for a long time, perhaps even for life. So given whatever the context was at that moment could potentially leave behind an ingrained thought or context that becomes a key part in your sexuality. But now I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, but Loxton, wouldn't that mean most people would have odd fetishes then? And good question. The example I gave was very specific. Some people might not even discover their sexual side until they've already developed it a little bit. Or they discovered these feelings in a more traditional way. No special context at all. Just, oh hey, I find these sexually attractive people to be sexually attractive. Go figure. Plus, all of our brains are built a little differently and develop in different ways, different orders, make different connections. And some formations are more likely to make 
fetishized contexts than others. Going off on a tangent now, some of you may have seen my video about how Super Smash Bros. is all in the imagination of a child with autism. At one point I mentioned that this boy may have developed a furry fetish. I brought this up because Basically, those with autism have a different brain structure and thus learn differently, and cling to certain things much more than the neurotypical population. This leads to those with autism to be much more likely to have a fetish. And these individuals are also more likely to get really into certain things they enjoy in early childhood. Commonly, cartoons, and video games, and they will continue to be super into them later in life. With the combination of being more likely to be really into cartoons, especially those targeted at children, thus with animals, and being more likely to develop fetishes, it's safe to say that those with autism are more likely to develop a furry fetish. But not as high as you'd think. Furries are so autistic is something a lot of people on the internet say. That is another misconception. So now let's look at the numbers and get the facts. Truth is, all these surveys I used earlier also found that compared to the general population, furries do have a heightened number of those with autism, but not nearly as much as people assume. So in the general population, 1.4 to 1.6% of people are somewhere on the autistic spectrum. Whereas, if you look at furries, about 4% of them are. So yes, furries are more than twice as likely to have autism as the general population, but still only 4%. That is very small. And now we will leave that tangent and answer the main question at hand. Though, taking everything I've said into context, the answer should be somewhat clear. Children like these designs because they are colorful and unique, and some simply don't grow out of it, just like comics and video games. And as you grow older, you happen to notice your sexual feelings while you are playing or watching some sort of anthropomorphized media. So let's say you watched Space Jam. You know. Hey. Hi, my name is Lola Bunny. <clears throat> you wanna play a little one-on-one, -on -one, doll? Doll? Uh-huh. On the court. Yes. Don't ever call me doll. Hey, nice playing with you. Having never felt sexual feelings before, and then all of a sudden, Lola Bunny gives you this happy sensation, your brain makes the context that animated bunny lady equals sexy, or video game bat lady cleavage is nice. And that's just the beginning. That's just what made the context. Now with the context ingrained into the brain, the brain wants more. Sexual arousal releases dopamine in the brain. Dopamine is like a natural drug. Animated bunny lady equals dopamine release, and it wants more dopamine. You start looking at more animated bunnies. You start drawing sexy animals. Search the web for sexy animals. And as you grow older, you find a self-building up community surrounding it, which also makes you happy, which releases more dopamine. And of course, your feelings into these characters grows as well. And remember how I said that anthropomorphized animals are more aesthetically intriguing to children because they are much more interesting than humans? Now throw sex into the mix. Sex makes everything more complicated. And by sex, of course, I mean porn. Humans, again, only have so many shapes and colors. But furry porn has unlimited potential. And it eventually becomes the number one thing you've searched on Google Images. That is, of course, if you are a furry and are one of the 37% that actually find it sexually intriguing. So, furries, now you know more about them and possibly more about yourself. From the inside, it's a welcoming community. And online, these individuals love coming together and sharing their art, talking about their passions, and not being tied to the physical manifestation that is real world limitations. And really, that's what a lot of geekier subcultures do anyway. A little weird, but aren't we all? Stay awesome, everyone.
Wait, what? I thought Tiny Kong was... Yeah. Yeah. Let me check. Oh, come on. Come on, where is it? Uh... Where could it be? Mmm. There it is. 64 games all look the same. Kong in Donkey Kong 64 was the cute little sister of Dixie Kong. Her design definitely resembles that of a little girl. But after Donkey Kong 64, we never really saw much of her. Until seven years later, when she would appear in Diddy Kong Racing DS. Only now she's turned into... Whoa, ho, ho. Oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, ho, oh. That's gross, DK. She's a minor. So let's just say puberty's doing its job and doing it well. So why the change, Nintendo? None of the other Kongs grew up. And she's supposed to be the little sister of Dixie, but now stands taller and is more developed than most of the Kongs. Now, she has a short top, relaxing sweatpants, painted nails, hoop earrings, makeup, but she did get to keep her neat hat. So Tiny Kong definitely now resembles a teenager instead of a kid. But does that mean Dixie and Diddy Kong are both fully grown? Over this time period, they haven't changed at all? So they're already fully grown? They still look like kids. This is all very confusing. And no, time travel was not involved. I'm able to make some pretty big stretches, but not that big. No, in instead, let's just take a quick look at how growth spurts work. A growth spurt is exactly what it sounds like. As you grow up, sometimes you'll grow up rapidly. In your preteen and early teenage years is when this will most occur. Boys can grow up to four inches per year and girls about three and a half inches per year. But Tiny Kong is an ape, not a human. Well, she's a very human-like anthropomorphized ape. So let's just assume the numbers are similar. With these stats, we could see that between these two games, seven years, she could have only grown about two feet. Of course, that's assuming that our real world time is the same amount of time taking place in these games, which is rarely ever the case, but whatever. But why would Dixie not grow up along with her little sister? Tiny Kong is obviously growing up into becoming another Candy Kong, so why not Dixie too? Well, it is possible that these two are not actually sisters. They could both be different species. So this is what Dixie Kong species looks like full grown, and this is Tiny and Candy. I mean, we all know that Diddy Kong is supposedly Donkey Kong's nephew, but that is impossible because they are completely different species. Donkey Kong is an ape. Notice the lack of tail, and Diddy Kong is a monkey. Notice the tail. So perhaps Diddy is the adoptive nephew, and this whole family is a lot less related than we've been led to believe. Another possibility is that along with her power to shrink, she can also make herself grow faster too. If you notice in the Donkey Kong 64 intro, Tiny Kong is already taller than Diddy Kong, meaning also taller than Dixie Kong since Diddy and Dixie are the same height. So perhaps with her supposed ability to grow as well, she might be able to advance her age quicker along with that. After all, when you start dealing with superpowers, and especially superpowered apes, anything really becomes possible. But enough about the in-game canonical reasoning. After all, none of the characters even mention that she had a growth spurt. It's as if she's always been that way. So why did Nintendo make the change? Likely, it's marketing and memorableness. Tiny and Dixie look somewhat similar, and compared to all the other Kongs, the most human-looking one is heavily sexualized, Candy Kong. As for other female Kongs, Wrinkly Kong is a granny, and later, 
dead. And Dixie Kong is too monkey looking, tomboyish. Not a huge amount of appeal. Little girl Tiny Kong is cute enough, but she lacks what Nintendo deemed as necessary to widen the appeal of Donkey Kong games. And that is a cute, hip, and feisty character. And dare I say, a little sexy. Candy Kong is a bit over the top. And when I say a bit, I, I mean a lot. This makes me very uncomfortable. But Tiny Kong hits the target demographic right on the money. But whatever the reason, I'm sure we can trust that Nintendo knows what they're doing. This was just a fun little look at a character design transformation. For an ape, DK sure has some mighty fine teeth. Or does he? Teeth. God, I love them. One of the defining features of a pretty face. Bones. Bones wrapped in enamel and melded together with luscious gums. Some say your teeth defines your character. Just look at squirrels. Squirrels are adorable. Then what does that say about one of the founding fathers of gaming? Donkey. Donkey Kong. One moment his teeth cause dentists to bask in glory. They aspire to someday be able to work on such a masterpiece. But other days, DK, as he's often known, has no teeth to speak of. I suppose you don't really need teeth to mash bananas, but then how? How do they manage to reappear? Does this beast have an ability to retract his teeth? It's possible, but not the most realistic. There must be a more obvious answer. Dentures. First of all, having dentures would make him just like his grandfather, Cranky Kong, who not only has dentures, but has amazing sleight of hand skills to hide them all. Where is he getting all these dentures from? So in Donkey Kong Country, Donkey Kong 64, and Mario Kart 64, we can see very clearly that DK has no teeth whatsoever, especially in the Donkey Kong Country cartoon, which is best not to speak of any further. But come Double Dash and Jungle Beat, voila, it's as if his teeth have always been there. But what's this? Super Smash Brothers and Donkey Kong Country Returns? They are missing once again, and then return in Freeze Dong. But it's not just entire games that they are completely missing or fully there, they often switch mid-game. Most scenes in Punch-Out has DK of the Toothless variation, but he occasionally bears his pearly whites. Same goes for Smash 4, and even when facing a boss in Donkey Kong Country Returns, a game where he supposedly has no teeth, he gains them to look more intimidating against the enemy. Speaking of Smash, just look at this. Most of the time, you can't see DK's teeth, no matter how hard you look. Yeah, yeah, those should be right there. But then occasionally, during certain moves like his side smash, side B, and up taunt, you can see them. Even one of his victory stances has him showing off his full set. So either DK has a set of dentures and just slips them in when he needs them with his incredible sleight of hand skills, or he can push his teeth in and out similar to Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon. And it's not just him, it's Diddy too. Really though, it's an interesting design choice. Toothless DK is a lot more cute and cuddly, whereas when he has his dentures in, he looks tough and intimidating. Or just silly. This may be common knowledge to some, but here we will look into the Donkey Kong legacy in detail and even bring up some controversy. Modern day Donkey Kong isn't the same ape as the Donkey Kong that kidnapped Pauline and fought Mario, who at the time was only known as Jumpman. This Donkey Kong is actually this Donkey Kong's grandfather, and is now known as Cranky Kong. He picked up the nickname Cranky after growing old and bitter on the island after the Great Ape Wars. No really, these are things that actually happened. Anyway, we know Cranky was once Donkey for a few reasons. One reason, which just so happens to be my favorite reason, is that in the beginning of Donkey Kong Country, we see Cranky Kong standing on top of a red construction beam similar to the arcade game, and he's playing a record player with the original arcade tune playing on it. Clearly, he is reminiscing of his past. And then DK comes in with his modern hip hop. This isn't the only way we know. 
Otacon in Super Smash Bros. Brawl stated that the original Donkey Kong was this Donkey Kong's grandfather. And Otacon is one trusty guy. Watch out! Cranky also makes remarks referencing this past of his, with lines like, Whisking maidens and tossing barrels seven days a week. Even the Donkey Kong Country manual clearly states this fact. Donkey Kong's Cranky Pappy is actually the original Donkey Kong who appeared in the Donkey Kong arcade classics of the 80s. So yeah, th that right there should, should really spell it out for you. This is pretty common knowledge. But if Cranky is the original DK, and is modern DK's grandfather, then who was DK's father? Why, it was Donkey Kong Jr. who starred in the Donkey Kong Jr. games. So we have Donkey Kong Sr., Donkey Kong Jr., and now Donkey Kong III. But I said there would be some controversy, so I'm gonna bring it. There are a few issues with this. Starting with the smaller problems, in Yoshi's Island DS, we see Baby Mario alongside Baby Donkey Kong, with a DK bib. But it was Donkey Kong Jr. who started the Donkey Kong clothing trend, not the original DK. So this must be intended to be modern Donkey Kong, and his bib is a reference to it eventually being a tie. Hmm. Something to think about. In the GBA remake of Donkey Kong Country 3, it is stated that Cranky Kong's first starring game would eventually be a game called Cranky Kong Country. But wasn't he the star of... Donkey Kong? Though maybe by starring they mean Cranky as the playable character, not the villain. Though the original Donkey Kong definitely has him in the starring role. His name is on the front of the machine. The biggest bit of controversy that involves a lot more thinking. What does Mario vs. Donkey Kong do to this whole mess? This is clearly modern DK. Not the nude DK Senior, not the leotarded DK Junior, but the tie-wearing shiny-toothed DK the Third. And despite the original DK aging so rapidly, and modern DK being full-grown as well, how come Mario and Pauline didn't age at all? In fact, Peach and Luigi bots are here too, and this is clearly taking place in the Mushroom Kingdom, not Brooklyn like the original arcade game. And Pauline is seen here merely as a VIP guest. It's as if this is when Mario and Pauline first met. And looking at the game manual, it says, Looks like Donkey Kong is up to his old tricks again! Yes! His old tricks of kidnapping Pauline and throwing barrels downstairs. Those are definitely what this Donkey Kong did. Yeah. Not this one, which became this one, but this one. Hmm. It's just something fun to think about. The overall Nintendo canon is that Cranky Kong was the original Donkey Kong. But that doesn't mean there aren't going to be a few contradictions every now and then. After all, no game company is perfect. I've never really been big on alcohol, though I've only been 21 for, what, like, six months? Though for a while, I was trying a lot of different kinds. I even went to a pub and got a beer sample. Every single one of them sucked. But anyway, that does make me curious about who are the drunkest characters in gaming. No, no. No, that's too easy. Games like GTA and Red Dead Redemption, you sort of expect games like these to have holy hammered individuals. Hmm, no. What I wonder is which games and characters do we assume are innocent, but actually have a huge alcohol kick? So making a rule, no games or characters that are M-rated, because that makes things way too easy. Now how could you even make a list like this without including Soda Popinski? It's so obvious that I'm just gonna throw him up as number five. In America, it's implied by his name that the bottles he drinks are merely full of soda. But being that this game is full of heavy stereotypes, and that Popinski is Russian, and the Russian stereotype is that they're all drunk on vodka all the time, it makes perfect sense that in the original version of the game, his name was in fact Vodka Drunkinsky. He's drunk on the battlefield. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. And speaking of battlefields, Fighting back goblins and other such monsters in Dragon's Crown is a blast, especially with all your friends, including Tiki. Imagine Navi and cross her with Tinkerbell and remove the whole annoying factor. You get Tiki. The thing is, despite being a young and innocent looking fairy, she's a hardcore drunk. Every single time you visit the tavern to plan your next mission, she's literally bathing in a goblet, drunk out of her mind. With such a small body, one cup of anything is enough to get her totally wasted. Plus, again, she's bathing in what her little stomach couldn't consume. All that alcohol will just find other ways into her body. 
Never heard of vodka tampons? But now we'll move away from the T rating, because you can kind of expect some level of alcoholism in T-rated games. The other three games I want to show you are all rated E. Meaning it's an even bigger surprise that these characters are drunks. And the first character in this E category is Wario. Wario is many things. A zombie, a vampire, a master of disguise, even a balloon. Is this what causes all these images? But what not very many people know is that he is also extremely weak to alcohol, which is surprising for an Italian. He gets drunk insanely easily, as seen in the Japanese version of Wario Land 2. This bird thing gets threatened by Wario's presence and sees that the only option is to throw his glass full of beer all over you. That's the smart thing to do, and Wario gets full-on drunk almost immediately from having a single mug of beer thrown at his face. Most beer only has about 5% alcohol, meaning it would normally take quite a bit to get a guy as large as Wario drunk. But nope, a splash in the face is all that it takes. Sucks for him. Granted, it doesn't suck as much as what the bird throws at him in the American version of the game, which is a bomb. Because how dare we show the consumption of alcohol? Let's just show a bomb exploding in someone's face instead. Violence is fine. That is the American way, after all. Of all the Mario characters to get drunk, it makes sense that Wario would be the one to do that. But he's not the only one. There is another. And judging by the thumbnail of this video, you probably already know. Princess Toadstool. Yeah. Peach here enjoys getting all red-faced in moments of victory. And I don't just mean in all this fan art that I totally didn't Photoshop. In Super Mario Kart, upon winning first place in a cup, you are rewarded with an entire champagne bottle. Yes, a whole one. Of course, they don't drink it in the American release of the game. But in the original Japanese version, they do. Characters besides Peach are seen drinking from it too. Bowser even pours the whole thing in his mouth. But he's a huge turtle thing. It'll take a lot more than that to even get him barely tipsy. But Peach, on the other hand, whoa, whoa, calm down. She just tips the bottle up and drinks the whole thing. Champagne is at minimum about 12% alcohol. And young women like Peach tend to get a little tipsy after just a glass or two. And she just chugs the whole thing. Woo! <coughs> And now I have one more character to share with you, and he is easily the hardest alcohol hitter in gaming. Period. And yes, he is in fact in an E-rated game. So who could this even be? It's the boy from Harvest Moon 64. Wait, wait, wait. this takes a little bit of explaining. On the first of every year, so New Year's. This town you call home holds a festival where they toast and drink liquor. You can go around and talk with people, toasting to each one and enjoying a nice cup of hard liquor. Judging by the color of the drink and that this is a farm town, there is likely a few vineyards not far off. So I think it's safe to say that this is red wine. So you go around talking to people, chugging away at the wine. Some people even want to have full-on drinking competitions with you meaning multiple drinks per person. All in all, you can have 28 glasses of red wine in about 10 hours. 28! And he's not even a full-grown man yet. Red wine is on average about 12% alcohol. And this cup is almost as big as he is! But, but then again, so is everything. Darn art styles. Graphically speaking, held items are upscaled so the player can see what they're even holding. So let's play it safe and assume that these glasses hold 8 ounces of wine. 8 ounces, after all, is the minimum size of a proper wine glass. Though these do look more like cups than proper wine glasses, but 8 ounces is still a decent size to go off of. Plus, 8 ounces is one cup, so it's an easy number to work with. But just note, this is on the small side of individual servings of wine. So this is the minimum. And when you hear what's next, the size won't even really matter. So long story short, whenever you drink anything, your body breaks it down to its base nutrients and then transports that nutrients through your blood. In this case, it's taking all the alcohol you drink and transferring that through your blood. And alcohol in the blood is what causes us to get tipsy. 
and eventually drunk. How drunk you are is actually measured by the amount of alcohol currently in your blood. For example, in the United States, you are legally considered intoxicated at 0.08% blood alcohol level, which means 0.08% of your blood is alcohol. And because intoxication is based on percentages, that does mean that bigger people take more alcohol to get drunker. Because they have more blood that it needs to flow through. The boy from Harvest Moon is not large. In fact, he's pretty small. But again, it's kind of hard to tell exactly how large it is because artistically they make everyone about the same size. But we do know that he's younger than most and is not necessarily well built. So let's go with 68 kilograms, which is about 150 pounds. Knowing all this, we can punch the numbers into some blood alcohol level calculators, which do exactly as they sound they should do. It calculates your blood's alcohol content, and it gives us an astonishing answer. 1.11%. Ho <laughs> 1.11%. .11%. Do you know what that can do to you? It's not pretty. At 0.08%, you are legally drunk. You can no longer drive by law. You have mild euphoria and some bit of visual impairment. Around 0.15%, you feel buzzed and have vastly decreased inhibitions. Around 0.25%, you are nauseated and confused. There is a chance you might black out. Between 0.3 and 0.4%, you are unarousable and lose control of your bladder. The chance of you blacking out is high, and anything above that, you are bound to fall unconscious, possibly knocked into a coma, and it makes it hard to breathe. And at 0.45%, you are near guaranteed to die. That's not even half of 1%. And this boy is at 1.11%. If he ain't king of the drunks, I don't know what he is. Give that boy a round of applause. And there you go. Games and characters from games you didn't realize were full of booze. Cheers. <coughs> oh, that's awful. Have you ever just Googled yourself out of sheer curiosity to see what popped up? Either your real name or perhaps a username that you use all over the place? I hadn't for a while, and just the other day I decided to try it out and see what would pop up. And I found this. I found out that I'm on a Wikipedia page entitled List of Game Theorists. Yeah, there I am. And there's MatPat, along with all these other people. Now looking at this, you may wonder, Who are you people? So today I'm gonna answer that. So first of all, game theory has been a thing since way before, well, game theory. Way before YouTube, even. Game theory is the study of strategic decision making. So imagine a lab, and there's two people playing a game of Risk, and there's a scientist watching over them, watching how they play and make decisions. That scientist works in the field of game theory. But it's way more than just the strategic decision making in games. It's more of just the strategic decision making in general, as a whole. For instance, Ariel Rubinstein is on this list. He is a famous economist, known for his work in game theory. When running a business, especially a massive corporation, your business strategies and all the decisions you make are super important. So a lot of these corporations will look to those who study game theory to help them make their business strategies. Economists are actually quite prevalent in the field of game theory. For instance, Reinhard Selton. He won the Nobel Prize for Economics for his contributions to game theory. In fact, a lot of these guys have won Nobel Prizes, but it's still more than just games and economy even. It's also used in military tactics, and also in biology. George Price and John Maynard Smith are both well known within the scientific community for their contributions to biology, specifically theoretical biology and genetics. They applied game theory to evolution and reproduction, and showed how strategy plays a role in choosing a mate, as well as doing a very in-depth study of the game of chicken. So really, game theory is just the study of strategy and decision making. All these scientists are world renowned for taking into account loads of graphs that use mathematical probability and applying it to many different facets of life. And then there are these two, people who make theories about video games. Game theory is really just a pun here, a play on words of 
actual game theory, since game theory and game theorists think about games scientifically and study them. Similar to actual game theorists. And puns are awesome, so no one's really complaining. Granted, most of these are hypotheses and not theories, but, but what are you gonna do? What happens when a gamer becomes a fairly important scientist and makes a new discovery? Things like Pikachu Rin happen. Johnny. <laughs> First described in 2008 in Japan by Shigeru Sato, he decided to name this high-energy protein after Pikachu, the beloved mascot of Pokémon. Shigeru named it Pikachu Rin because both Pikachu and this new protein have lightning-fast moves and stunning electric effects. Also, it was discovered in a mouse, though it was later confirmed to also exist in humans. Pikachurin is a dystroglycin interlacing protein that has an essential role in the precise interactions between the photoreceptor ribbon synapse and the bipolar dendrites. And if I were to explain that to someone without a supreme interest in biology, I would tell them this. As your eyes take in light, that light hits your photoreceptors. That light signal then travels to your brain, which processes it. And that is how we see. Pikachurin helps convert that light into a sort of electrical energy, which the brain can then understand. And that explanation is so much simpler. Pikachurin isn't required to see, nor is it the only protein that does this job, but it does play a big part of helping it. So thank you, Pikachu. Seeing is pretty good. But it's not the only biological discovery named after a Pokémon. There is also the ZBTB7 gene. Catchy name, but it was originally named Pokémon. Pokémon! The Pokémon gene. It was named this because Pokémon happened to work as an acronym for its scientific name, that being P-O-K, Earthroid, Myloid, Ontogenic Factor. Pok, E, M, mm, On. But why the switch to Zebus here? I'm sure you can guess. Nintendo and the Pokémon Company threatened legal action unless they changed the name. It wouldn't be too bad to name a gene after a Pokémon, after all, they're fine with pikachu -rin. It's just that, in this case, this is the gene most responsible for cancer. I doubt any company wants to be associated with that. What happens when a gamer becomes a fairly important scientist and makes a new discovery? Things like Sonic Hedgehog happen. The Sonic Hedgehog protein is one of three proteins in the Hedgehog signaling pathway group of proteins, all of which are encoded by the Sonic Hedgehog gene. There is Desert Hedgehog and Indian Hedgehog, both named after real species of hedgehog. And then there's Sonic Hedgehog, named after the video game character. The vast majority of mammals have these three, though Sonic is the most important. So what does it do? The hedgehog signaling pathway is what transmits information from a mother to its embryo. Genetic information about how to form a fetus. The sonic hedgehog protein specifically transmits data on how to form proper vertebrae, spinal cords, your central nervous system, digit growth on limbs, and the organization of the brain. Yes, sonic is in control of how your brain is formed as a fetus. After the mammal is born, however, this gene doesn't stop being useful. As the mammal grows, Sonic Hedgehog becomes responsible for the cell division of adult stem cells, which are basically blank cells. They aren't skin cells, or brain cells, or organ cells. They are blank, and they can become any type of cell. And it's Sonic's responsibility to make sure they duplicate. Also in adults, Sonic Hedgehog helps heal damaged hair follicles, as well as helps build tooth enamel. Sonic does a lot of stuff, or at least, it does when there isn't any Robotnikin involved. And that's not a joke. Robotnikin is a thing too. It's a Sonic Hedgehog inhibitor. If, for whatever reason, you wanted your Sonic Hedgehog to stop, you simply apply Robotnikin. <laughs> Even super serious scientists have to find fun every now and then. Though the name Sonic Hedgehog isn't appreciated by everyone. For instance, if while in the womb a fetus has a mutated Sonic Hedgehog gene, then their brain won't form properly. Most commonly, their brain doesn't divide into two hemispheres, a condition known as holoprosencephaly. A good number of children with this condition don't live very long, and even if they do, it's a life full of seizures, constant medication, and a plethora of mental problems. Now imagine a doctor telling some new parents that the reason their baby is having so many seizures and has a high mortality risk is because of a mutation in its sonic hedgehog gene. <laughs> can't take it seriously. <laughs>
Something that's bothered a lot of 90s kid gamers is the name change that went on in the Sonic the Hedgehog series. Why would they change Dr. Robotnik's name into Dr. Eggman? Let's go over that. Dr. Ivo Robotnik, the evilest man in all the land. Oh, that's good. That's very good indeed. He's so menacing. Pingers! And not. Despite the many different looks of Robotnik, he's still been Dr. Robotnik from his distribution to the West all the way until Sonic Adventure, when they started calling him Eggman. Wait, did you hear that sentence? From his distribution to the West. To the West. That's right. He's only been known as Dr. Robotnik in the Western world, and originally only in Sonic 1's instruction manual. In Japan, he's always been known as Dr. Eggman. Yeah, even in the classic Sonic games. If you read the names of Robotnik's ships, they are all labeled as Eggman. So why would Sega of America switch him to Robotnik? Some think that it's because American distributors wanted him to sound more menacing. And since at the time, we were fresh out of the Cold War, making his name sound Russian is a good way to do that. Robotnik sounds like Sputnik, the Russian satellite that struck fear in Americans when it was launched. Russia beat us to Space! Oh, the humanity! After some time and popularity gain, a few Sonic cartoons started appearing in the West. And they frequently said Robotnik. This is what drilled that name into our little heads. So upon later hearing Sonic call him Eggman... I guess Eggman's got one of them. What? What? It was enraging. What the crap is an Eggman? Well, he's been Eggman here in the West for quite some time now, so I'm sure the bulk of us have accepted that he's Eggman now. No. My childhood will not be ruined. Sonic hasn't existed since 1998. Mm -hmm. I'm just hoping to clear up any remaining bits of confusion. So have some fun facts! It's not fun, nor is it a fact. You're stupid. While in Japan he's always been known as Eggman, this has always been a nickname. His full name is and has always been Dr. Ivo Robotnik. Sonic and his friends simply use Eggman as an insult because he's so egg-shaped. <laughs> if it isn't Sonic! Look, it's a giant copy egg! Fighting machine! I am Dr. Robotnik, the greatest scientific genius in the world! Whatever you say, Eggman! This was the first time we in the West heard the name Eggman, and if you understand the context... Whatever you say, Eggman! It was Sonic insulting him. In an interview, the creator stated that they made this scene this way exclusively to clear up the confusion about his name, starting with, I am Dr. Robotnik, is a way to remind us all and reassure us that his name is in fact Dr. Robotnik. Then, Sonic calls him Eggman as an insult, and proceeds to only call him Eggman from then on. Sonic and his friends call him Eggman so much that he eventually took the name and began calling himself that. This scene is a pretty clever way of storytelling to clear up changes that some guy at Sega of America sillily made. Though really, they had a good reason to change it. First of all, as I have already mentioned, it's a more sinister name. And at the time, a ton of children's cartoons were all about environmentalism and saving the planet and animals. So a guy who shoves animals into robots and destroys forests with a name like Robotnik makes a lot of sense. It is also possible that they feared a lawsuit from John Lennon over the Eggman title, since the Beatles have a hit song by the same name. Granted, the song nowadays is more well known as I Am The Walrus. In fact, the name Ivo Robotnik could even be a reference to John Lennon. Ivo is short for the name Ivor, which is a common variation of the name Ivan. Ivan has its roots in Russian. In fact, it's the Russian version of John. The name Robotnik has its roots in Czech, and can be translated as slave worker. If you know the Beatles song I Am The Eggman, Man, also known as I Am The Walrus, John Lennon plays the role of the Eggman. So the Eggman, who is John Lennon and Ivo Robotnik, can be translated as John the Slave Worker, or you could even translate it as John the Working Class Hero, which is another song by John Lennon. Taking it even further, John's son's name is Julian, and coincidentally enough, in the Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon, Robotnik's first name was changed to Julian. Another fun fact is that Dr. Eggman was designed after Theodore Roosevelt, and I'll just leave you with that. So, Dr. Ivo Robotnik has always been his real name, and Eggman has always been his nickname in Japan, and has been his nickname in the Western world since Sonic Adventure. And now you know! What you are looking at is nothing. Nothing but a point. As you have learned in geometry, a point has no space, no dimension. It's 
imaginary, a position within a system. But now if we add another point and draw a line between them, we now have a diagram of the first dimension. Anything existing within the first dimension only has length, point A to point B. It's a line. There is only left and right. No up or down, or forwards and backwards. Now if I were to draw another line, you can recognize this as a graph, X and Y. There is now left, right, and up and down. Kind of like Mr. Game & Watch. But now if we add another line, we get the Z axis. The third dimension. Where all of us reside, including all the other Smash characters. Most modern video games use models moving within a 3D virtual world. And now if we were to again think about all the Smash Bros characters, Mr. Game & Watch is the only one stuck in the second dimension. So what would it be like to live life as a two-dimensional being? How would seeing in the third dimension work for someone like Mr. Game & Watch? <laughs> Imagining a world with length and width but no depth is mind-boggling. A good mind exercise. But is something physically existing, or even physically living, even possible in such a world? I'd like to point to the book Flatland by Edwin Abbott, published in 1884. There's also a low-budget animated movie based on the book, and I'll be using clips from that to explain some of my points. Flatland is about a world which exists in the second dimension, and a man from the third dimension comes to spread the gospel of 3D. Since after all, 3D persons are like gods compared to 2D persons. There is a lot of social and religious commentary within the story, but that's for another time. A good chunk of the story is mainly just explaining how their world works. At one point, the square tries to communicate with a one-dimensional being, telling them about the second dimension, but the one-dimensional beings call it magic and heresy. Coincidentally enough, this is exactly what goes on when the three-dimensional being explains the third dimension to the square. The square assumes the sphere is a demon. There's no other way for the sphere to know the contents of his house, his whole town, and even his insides, because the square has no means of seeing in the third dimension, like the sphere. At one point, the sphere even watches the square's dream, since absolutely everything, even the square's 2D thoughts, are visible from the 3D perspective. What's interesting is that their eyes are on the outside of their bodies. This is because if their eyes were on the inside, like how you would normally draw someone from the side, that would mean all they can see is the inside of their face. So now with the eye on the outside, they can see the world around them. But what is that like? You might assume the explanation would be like this. In the second dimension, all you see are lines. Like this. But in reality, the second dimension is infinitely thin. Zero thickness whatsoever. So in reality, this is what you would see. So to get around in a world like this, all the creatures would have to feel everything and see colors and intensity rather than depth. They can see feel how close they are to something, as well as how intense its brightness is. If you were to pass a human through their 2D world, their 2D perspective, then the human would look more like an MRI scan slice. So from the perspective of a 2D being, we could pop in and out of existence as if by magic, which is why the square was so terrified of the sphere. Our 3D shape and texture would be inconceivable to the 2D beings, since texture is only possible in the third dimension. But then from our perspective, these 2D lines would be useless information to us. Though perhaps this line, while useless to us, is all it really takes to move around in the second dimension. After all, these creatures have lived in it all their lives. Surely they are accustomed to it. And even without sight, there is feel. Feel as in physical touch, but also electromagnetism, or aura. Back to Mr. Game & Watch, he clearly has no eyes because truly seeing in 2D is all theoretical, and without other cues like constant sound and feeling the world around you, sight by itself in the second dimension is quite meaningless. Which is why Mr. Game & Watch has no eyes. But sight isn't the only issue. 
moving around in a 3D world as a 2D being would require immense strength just to hold yourself upright. And even the slightest breeze could <sighs> whisk you away. Because you are infinitely thin, and thus infinitely light. But when fighting, this thinness also has quite an advantage. Like paper. <laughs> Every hit is like a paper cut, only with the sharpest paper physically possible. Realistically, hitting the side of a 2D object would split the 3D object perfectly. A scary thought. But what if you were to hold Mr. Game & Watch? That is, from the sides as in his sides where he is flat. If you were to clap him between your hands, would you just feel your hands? Because he has zero depth at all, so really there should be no space whatsoever between your hands. Or would feeling him be like feeling the smoothest surface imaginable? Because in 2D, there's no such thing as roughness, no such thing as texture because that can only exist where we have depth. So would he be a ridiculously silky smooth little man? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. So in conclusion, being Mr. Game & Watch, or any 2D being in a 3D world, not only requires immense strength, but it also grants you impossible sharpness, impossible smoothness, but also no sight at all or at least limited sight. Very, very limited. So to the point where it might as well not be used. So you'd have to feel the world around you, either physically or through echolocation, like dolphins, or feeling electromagnetic fields like what sharks do, or perhaps they feel in a more spiritual way, like that of Lucario. And speaking of spirituality and dimensions, being a 2D being and looking up at a 3D being would be like looking in the face of an angel or a demon, depending on how they want to act around you. And vice versa, being a 3D being looking down upon a 2D world, you would see everything, even their thoughts. So it would make us 3D beings feel like gods to them. So if us 3D beings are like that to 2D beings, then what are 4D beings like to us? And what about five-dimensional beings, six-dimensional beings? Science has said that there are about 11 dimensions. Some scientists say 10. It's between 10 and 11. That's the debate. Anyway, get your philosophical and physicist sides out and tell me down below what you think. Bethesda. This game developer and publisher are best known for its highly immersive and expansive worlds found within the Elder Scrolls and Fallout. They are also known for releasing games filled to the brim with bugs. But that's beside the point. With Fallout 4 just around the corner, I thought it would be interesting to find out what Bethesda's first game ever was. <laughs> Bethesda got their start in the same place they are now, primarily on PC gaming. Throughout the 80s, PC gaming was significantly different than it is today. You had only a few options for pre-built computers, and they boasted about screens, now with color, and 512 kilobytes of RAM, and even a working clock! Who would have thought? Home computers were still in their youth, while video game consoles like the NES were just sparking and booming with popularity. So most game developers were in the process of moving over to exclusive console gaming rather than PC gaming. But not Bethesda. In fact, while Bethesda would release its first game in 1986, they would stick to PC gaming exclusively until 2001. But now let's get on to that first game in 1986. Bethesda had just opened its doors a year prior. In Bethesda, Maryland, by the way. Which is what the company is named after. In case you didn't figure that out already. When the time came to reveal their first game, they truly showed off their programming skills. This game was Gridiron! Exclamation point included. A football simulator for the Amiga and the Atari ST, both home computers at the time. Gridiron, with the explanation point, can't forget that, was a revolutionary football game. Seriously, revolutionary. I mean, look at it! Okay, bad example. So graphically speaking, it does not impress anybody. I mean, here's some footage from football games released prior to this one. So Gridiron does not look like much of a football game, so what gives? Well, it's the first football game 
to play like one. What do I mean by that? I mean, this game has actual physics being calculated here. All of the computer's power is going towards calculating the outcomes of various plays, rather than on looking good. Things such as player weight and momentum are all taken into account, so the heavier a player is, the better he can tackle lighter ones, and they all bounce off of each other and ram into each other accurately. Accurate physics simulation like this was revolutionary for the time, so of course this gathered the attention of EA, who wanted to begin making the John Madden football series. So they signed a deal with Bethesda to make a sequel to Gridiron under the John Madden name. But eventually, and not much detail is known about this to the public, the game Bethesda was working on was scrapped and thrown out by EA. They didn't want it and let Bethesda go. But they took the physics programming from Gridiron and pasted it into their own version of John Madden football. Bethesda, of course, sued EA over this, and no information on the outcome has been made known to the public. Fallout Shelter is the Fallout spin-off mobile game where you take care of a bunch of people in your vault. You are their vault overseer, you see. But I was wondering, this game doesn't give you a clear sense of location. So just where is this vault located? John. <laughs> Firstly, it's very safe to say it is based in the US, because every Fallout game is in the US. That's the whole point of the game, 1950s US style. And now we'll look outside for some clues. There are mountains. This is a feature that's actually not too common in the US. Most people in the US have them on their horizons, but that's because most people in the US live on the sides, where they all happen to be. So we know this game has to be based on one of the sides of the US. My next thought was, maybe since it's a spin-off, it's located near an area we've already been in a previous Fallout game. The first Fallout takes place in Southern California, the second in Northern California, making this the only game or piece of media ever to recognize my hometown's existence. So happy. Fallout Tactics is in Chicago, Brotherhood of Steel is in the area surrounding Carbon, Texas which is a very small town. Interesting. Fallout 3 surrounds the areas of Washington, D.C. and Pittsburgh, New Vegas has Southern Nevada and a bit of Utah, and 4 is in the Boston area. But now, even if we only consider these locations, it's still quite a bit. Maybe the flora will be of use. Dead trees! Well, this one with its low branches and being a tall triangle shape makes it likely to be a pine or evergreen, but both of those basically grow everywhere on the North American coasts. Maybe if we look at the people, the people you can get in this game are very ethnically diverse. You basically get an equal amount of each race, which is crazy and accurate, but political agendas aside, this basically rules out NorCal, Utah, and Oregon, as they are all whiter than a cheesecake. But as for other locations, none of them are quite as close to equal all races as Fallout Shelter. But at least most of these other areas are still significantly more diverse than these ones. So looking at the people as a whole only helps a little bit. But what now if you look at specific people? For instance, I know you could have Lucas Sims in your vault, the Sheriff of Megaton from Fallout 3, and there are actually quite a number of Fallout 3 characters, such as Eulogy Jones, Jericho, Madison Lee, Elder Lions, etc. Seeing this, I decided to find every special character, and sure enough, all but one of them are from Fallout 3. So that points us right at the wastelands around the Washington DC area. Though what about that one person? Preston Garvey is the only special character not from Fallout 3. He's from Fallout 4. But this changes nothing because as it turns out, people have these things called legs, and they can use them to travel long distances. Washington DC isn't that far from Boston, where Fallout 4 is based. So considering there are no characters from Fallout 1, 2, or New Vegas, which are all on the western US, it's very safe to say that Fallout Shelter takes place somewhere around Washington DC in the eastern US. Wandering the hot, dry nuclear wasteland that was once a fully populated area can really take its toll on your body. You need to stay hydrated, and you need precious energy. So when you stumble onto an ice cold bottle of Nuka Cola, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. 
I mean, sure, it may be flatter than Lucina, but it's the one moment of true bliss you've had since entering this godforsaken wasteland. Then, off in the distance, you see it. A light blue glow from within a window. You break in, and you see it. Nuka-Cola Quantum. You've seen the ads. It has twice the calories, twice the carbohydrates, twice the caffeine, and twice the taste. And to make it stand out more on the shelves and give it that extra kick, the Quantum includes a mild radioactive isotope. So it even makes your urine glow with radiation. Yay! This drink often has many jokes surrounding it, but what would drinking it actually do to you? Johnny. The typical tale goes that Nuka-Cola Quantum was never fully tested long term, and while they were beginning testing and sending it out to testers, well, the war happened. So no one truly knows the long term effects of drinking Nuka-Cola Quantum. But what we do know is how they made it glow. They used strontium isotopes. But which ones? There are a number of natural and artificial strontium isotopes, but thankfully we don't need to do any hard science to figure this one out, as reports from the Nuka-Cola plant in Washington, D.C. state they use the strontium isotope SR90. SR90 is a byproduct of nuclear fission, which is when atoms split into smaller parts. And SR90 isn't terribly radioactive, it's used in things like televisions, thermal generators, and spacecrafts. It's even used for its glowing properties in things like glow sticks and glow-in-the-dark paints. It can even glow in its pure form, though not as much as Nuka-Cola Quantum. But all of these things I've mentioned are things you would not typically ingest. Well, SR90 is also used in toothpaste for sensitive teeth. Which, I mean, I know you aren't supposed to ingest toothpaste, but you always do a little. But SR90 is also used in bone vitamins. Vitamins for increasing your bone strength. Though, in very minute amounts. But neither of these things really glow. So Nuka-Cola Quantum must be using significantly more of it. So what are the long-term effects of being exposed to larger amounts of SR90? I mean, after all, SR90 was among the most important isotopes regarding health impacts after the Chernobyl disaster. Well, thankfully, just being exposed to SR90, by itself that is, is, quote, not a major concern because strontium-90 emits no gamma radiation, and its decay product, yttrium-90, emits only a small amount, end quote. That's said by the Health Physics Society, an organization whose primary objective is to study and document the effects of various kinds of radiation on human health. Oh, so that's good, but the same study also says strontium is a health hazard only if it is taken into the body. Oh. Well, well, great. So exactly what we're doing with Nuka-Cola Quantum. And this is why SR90 was super terrible during the Chernobyl incident. Not because it was one of the types of radiation to harm humans for being too close to something, but because SR90 got into the water supply and people would drink it. Thankfully though, our bodies for the most part know what they're doing. And thus, around 80% of any ingested amount of strontium is sent straight out of the body through urination. But that remaining 20% can be all it takes to deal some damage. Though, only if you ingest strontium in large amounts. So there's nothing to really fear from toothpaste and calcium tablets. There simply isn't enough SR90 to cause harm in those. But if someone were to be drinking multiple bottles of soda that has so much SR90 in it that it glows? That is going to cause some health problems. So what are those health problems? Well, in the body, it acts similar to calcium, as 99% of all strontium that does get stored in your body goes into your bones and bone marrow. The remaining 1% is just all over. This is why strontium is used in bone strengthening pills, when in minuscule amounts, it works alongside calcium to boost your bone power. But in larger amounts, it most commonly leads to bone cancer. And also myeloma, which is cancer of the bone marrow. And leukemia, which is blood cancer. And this is because blood is formed in the bone marrow. And if your bone marrow is irradiated, then the blood it creates can become cancerous. Bone cancer and myeloma are each considered to be one of, if not the most painful types of cancer to get. 
I mean, think about it. To treat cancer, you need to go through chemotherapy, which is hard and painful in itself. But at least for the most part, tumors of the flesh and organs are still squishy. But bone tumors? Imagine your bones scraping against one another. Imagine the flesh around the rough bone tumor moving around it. Plus, it makes all of your bones weak, sometimes to the point where they will frequently chip all over. Constant fracturing. Not to mention that chemotherapy and most traditional means of treating cancer patients don't work nearly as effectively on bone cancer as it does with others. Commonly, if you get bone cancer, then whichever bones are cancerous, simply need to be removed and replaced by an artificial bone. But sometimes, whole limbs need to be amputated. It's rough. Cancer is always rough, but bone cancer is also literally rough. So, drinking too much Nuka-Cola Quantum will definitely heighten your risk of bone cancer, myeloma, and leukemia. So if you ever see some sort of glowing beverage in your grocery store, just don't drink it. Nothing drinkable should ever glow. Star Fox 64, aka the best one. Until Zero comes out. Hopefully. A fun fact that's frequently thrown around the internet is that Fox and his crew have chopped off their legs and replaced them with robot legs. This helps them when flying, in more ways than one. Let's cover those. Becoming a pilot takes a lot of training. Not just on how to fly the jet, but on withstanding the G-forces involved. G-forces are a bit tricky to explain in a short amount of time, so I'll explain with an example. In your chair right now, you are experiencing 1G, the gravitational pull of the Earth. Now think about when you are in a car, sitting at a stoplight and it turns green. You zoom forward and your head falls back a bit. You are now experiencing more Gs in a backwards direction. You can especially feel Gs in a car ride over some hills or on a roller coaster. As you begin an arc downward and fall, you lift off your seat a little and you get a head rush. You feel like your guts are lifting up from inside of you. And that's because they are. And when you hit a loop or begin raising on a dip, the exact opposite feeling happens. You feel heavier and shorter, like all your weight is being applied downwards. And that's because it is. Many people will often feel a bit lightheaded after a dip like that. And this is because your blood is liquid and wants to go where gravity and momentum tells it to. And as additional g-forces are applied downward, your blood rushes away from the brain to your feet, which can leave you literally lightheaded and feel daisy. When in an aircraft though, especially during dogfights as you dive and dip and move and spin around, the body goes through significantly more g-forces than a roller coaster can deliver. This can cause vomiting and unconsciousness to an untrained person, which is why the greatest pilots are those who have gone through the most intense training and can endure it, only losing color vision occasionally. They too still feel lightheaded, but they learn to power through it. But there are some who have learned a few tricks to it. For instance, you can wear G-suits, suits specifically designed to hold your legs tightly so they can't fill with all your body's blood, leaving more for your brain. Then there's also these real World War II pilots, some of the best World War II pilots, Douglas Bader, Alexei Marciev, and Colin Hodgkinson, all of which had their legs amputated, and all of which claimed this made them better pilots because now they had less space for blood to leave to. But wait, what about this video? Hold on, hold on. These videos are similar enough as it is, until I bring up my new point, but I suppose I'll need to clear up some things regarding this one. The body is amazing, and can very much compensate for lost things. For instance, if you lose your sight, your other senses become enhanced. You lose your legs and all the veins and arteries within them, and your body knows not to produce more blood than it can hold. Your blood pressure has everything to do with how well your heart can pump blood to the brain. And since your body balances itself, after the limb loss, it would soon rebalance its blood pressure. Also, the path from the heart to the brain is direct, so chopping off your legs doesn't shorten the length it takes to get blood from the heart to the brain. It's these points that this video uses to bust the myth that amputating your legs makes you able to withstand more Gs. But here's what I'm now adding. I'm re-mentioning those G-suits. Those G-suits that have millions upon millions of dollars of research put into them, and are proven to allow trained pilots to withstand an extra 1 to 2 Gs than without them. Here's some more detail on how they work. Normally, when taking a lot of downward G-forces, all that blood rushes down to your feet and calves. You still have blood all throughout the body, but a lot more of it is down low, maxing out the amount your veins and arteries in the legs can hold. In other words, 
a larger percentage of your blood is now in your feet. With these G-suits, however, they squeeze your legs, allowing only the amount of blood required to sustain your legs through. Your legs cannot fill any further. Now, instead of all that blood pooling at your feet and legs, it pools at your hips and lower gut, which is significantly closer to your heart than your feet are. So when the G-forces return to normal, that blood reaches the heart and the brain faster than if it were at your feet. So the same can be said of amputating your legs. In Fox's case, now no blood can go anywhere below his knees, and he likely also has a sort of G-suit squeezing his thighs meaning he doesn't have any feet distant blood that has to make its way all the way back to his heart. At most, it's at knee level, and even then, it's still mostly in his lower torso. This gets pumped back to his heart quicker, so it can refill it with oxygen in the lungs and reach the brain through its direct path. This is the only part it speeds up, not the rest. So, amputated legs are better for pilots than squeezed legs, and squeezed legs are better than just legs. In Star Fox 64's multiplayer, we see them running around. Very quickly. Like, OMG, so fast. Wow. Is Doge still funny? I'm behind on the times. Wait, was Doge ever funny? Anyway, time to add a new point. This was all in Star Fox 64, but other games to come out after Star Fox 64 contain a character named Crystal. What's most important about her, aside from her contribution to the furry fandom, is that she is very clearly seen walking around on non-robot feet. Not very earth-shattering right now, but we'll get to that. Also, Fox is seen in long pants and giant clunky boots. Some say, oh, he has normal feet and not robot feet anymore, so not canon, which is silly, and to which I say, maybe these are just long pants to protect him from the cold. He does go into a few snow and ice areas outside the comfort of a spaceship, and these large boots are to lessen the pressure of the metal legs, making it easier to walk in bogs. His robot legs are still very present within the boots. After Star Fox Adventures, we have Star Fox Assault. Crystal has now joined the Star Fox team, and a good number of characters are shown with the classic metal peg leg design, robot legs, while others look like they have legs with a newer look. They appear more like clothing. Now what's striking is that it doesn't look like Crystal has either of these versions. This looks way too much like just clothing, as it's a lot more fluid than even Falco's. So Crystal still does not have robot legs. And how does this impact her usefulness? Let's look at the character stats in Assault. The different characters' stats vary drastically between health, speed, jump, and pilot skill. One major thing is that Crystal is the worst pilot and worst vehicle user overall, while some characters are more skilled at one vehicle and may be hindered in another. And jokes about, it's because she's a woman and women can't drive, lol, aside, it could very well be that the robot legs are to better connect the pilot's otherwise unused leg muscles and nerves to better control the machines, with some leg versions being excellent at adapting to any vehicle, or maybe better suited for one and poorly compatible with another. Do you get what I mean by that? I'm saying that since these robot legs are already connected to their nerves and receive their brain signals in order to perform as amazingly as they do, they could very well plug their legs into the machines they pilot and feel the R-Wing, or feel the Landmaster. This makes me think about episode 11 of Teen Titans, when Cyborg finishes his car and describes it like this. 100,000 horsepower plasma turbine engine, all-terrain hover jets, anti-lock air brakes, and an onboard computer that links with my systems, so I can literally feel the road. Being able to literally feel the machine you're piloting gives you a huge advantage which is also why this is a common function in many mecha animes. And Crystal not having robot legs to plug into the machines, thus not feeling them, would definitely be a huge hindrance. Making her low piloting skill makes sense. The most difficult thing to prove this is that there's nothing in first person to any degree, so we can't really see anything from the character's point of view. The pilot's cockpits are either all opaque to the outside or covers the pilot from the waist down, so we have no visual way to prove this. Though, also no visual proof to disprove it, and some jet cockpits already look like these pilots are plugging their legs in place. Perhaps Star Fox Zero will shed some light on this. Being able to feel the R-Wing when in walker mode would be especially beneficial. Miyamoto recently confirmed the classic fan theory that Super Mario Bros. 3 is just a play, not actually happening. So what was that theory? That's now proven as fact. Sean. <laughs> 
Super Mario Bros. 3 is hailed by many as one of the greatest 2D platformers of all time, but it had some interesting design choices that led to one of the most popular video game theories of all time. That being, Mario here is never in any real danger. This is all a setup, a play, and you, the player, are watching from the perspective of the audience. So what led to this conclusion? Well, first of all, at the beginning of the game, you are shown a big red curtain that raises and shows off the title screen. Not only this, but looking at the level design, these blocks are bolted down into the sky, and they are leaving shadows on the sky. A normally impossible feat unless the sky is only a few feet back because it is actually just a sky-colored backdrop that the blocks are bolted to. The moving platforms also have lines cut into the sky for the machines behind the sky to move those platforms. And all of these platforms are bolted into the ceiling. And at the end of each level, you exit, stage right even, right into an area behind the scenes. This theory has always been quite popular. But recently, Nintendo UK did a Mario Myths interview with Miyamoto. And when asked about this myth, Miyamoto responded, So, this theory is now 100% canon, but what does this mean for Mario? If Super Mario Bros. 3 was just a stage play, and Super Mario Bros. 2 was just a dream, this raises more questions. Is Paper Mario also not actually happening? Does it just take place in a storybook? You can actually see one of the ghosts in Luigi's Mansion reading a book titled Mario's Story, which is the Japanese name of Paper Mario. Plus, with the upcoming crossover of the Mario and Luigi series with Paper Mario, it doesn't make sense for there to be two Marios without some time travel being involved. So within the Super Mario Bros. world, Paper Mario may be a fictional Mario pulled from within the book, similar to the idea of Inkheart. Anyway, so what is now known is that Super Mario Bros. 3 is simply a play. Perhaps one documenting and exaggerating the original tale of Super Mario Bros. And thanks to Miyamoto 27 years later, it's now confirmed as just a play. Here is an interesting question to think about. What counts as a separate game? Now, at first glance, this seems like a silly question. No one would confuse Chrono Trigger for Super Mario Galaxy. But what about sequels? What about Super Mario Galaxy and Super Mario Galaxy 2? But what about director's cuts? What about HD re-releases? Let's use our noggins. Noggin. <laughs> Hello all, it is Loxton. And thinking about this question, what counts as a separate game, is actually a lot more interesting than you'd think. There's some bit of philosophy involved. But for simplicity's sake, let's start by just talking about Pokemon. Every main title in this series is released in two separate games. Red and Blue, Gold and Silver, X and Y, and sometimes a third game is thrown in there. The differences between these versions are minor. There are some Pokémon that are only catchable in one version of the game or another, and sometimes different events will occur within game. But is that enough to call it a completely different game? Nintendo thinks so, as they advertise it as Pokémon Black and White. X and why. There's that and in there which separates them. But when Pokemon fans refer to these games, they typically refer to them as an acronym, such as Auras, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, or HGSS, Heart Gold and Soul Silver. This could be basically because from the fans' perspective, they are indeed one game. But when you throw in the third title, things start to get confusing. For instance, Pokemon Emerald basically took Pokemon Sapphire and Pokemon Ruby, merged them, and then added additional content, essentially showing that Pokemon Ruby and Pokemon Sapphire didn't have to be separated at all. They could very easily have just been one game. The same goes for all the games that have done this. So in the case of Pokemon, are Diamond and Pearl two separate games? And with the inclusion of Platinum, are they three separate games? Or do they all combine to make DPP, as it's typically referred to by fans? But this is just one step into the foggy abyss that is this question. And let's take a step further. What about re-releases? What about HD remakes and director's cuts? 
Well, first of all, there's the big HD re-releases, such as DuckTales Remastered. DuckTales Remastered was a 2013 remake of a game from 1989. While the core levels and game mechanics are very identical, even the same, this remake added levels, voice acting, and crazy updated the graphics. But at its core, is this still the same game? Just updated? Well, maybe we should look at another example of an HD re-release, like The Last of Us Remastered. This was a 2014 remastering of a 2013 game. The original Last of Us was released on the PlayStation 3, but with the new PlayStation 4 out now, Naughty Dog decided to update the graphics a bit and release The Last of Us on the PlayStation 4 as The Last of Us Remastered. So is a slight graphical update worthy of making this considered a different game? Now, let's look at director's cuts, like, for instance, Deus Ex Human Revolution, director's cut. On top of the slight graphical update, it also includes additional content, that being the DLC. And Fallout 3 Game of the Year Edition is just Fallout 3 with all of the DLC pre-installed. Does that make it a different game? Now what if you buy one set of DLC, and your friend buys a completely different set of DLC? Are you both playing the same game, or are they now different? separate, considered to be different games altogether. If adding content to the game changes the game, that is, makes it considered a different game, then what about console-exclusive content? For instance, Destiny on the PlayStation 4 has plenty of exclusive side quests. So does that make the PS4 version of Destiny completely different from the Xbox One version? Now what if you applied that logic to every multi-platform game? For instance, throwing it out there, 2013 Tomb Raider. This game has QuickTime events. On the PlayStation, the QuickTime events show shapes. On the Xbox 360 and PC, they show letters. Does that separate them because they each have different content? Different graphics. So are these two separate games? Now what about games that are collections of games? Like, uh, like... Everything just fell. Like Namco Museum 50th Anniversary. This game includes 14 classic hits. Now obviously Pac-Man and Galaga are completely separate games, but on this, do they still count as separate individual games? Do you hold in your hand right now 14 classic hits? Or is this one game, one Namco Museum 50th Anniversary? If you do include all of these games, are you now holding 15 games instead of the 14 it claims it has, because this in itself is another game? I'd like to point to Wrestle's Paradox, the classic, does a set of all sets contain itself? As I've been pondering this question, things have been getting grayer and grayer. So let's get even grayer still. Do game updates make games different? As in, do they count as different games? Let's look at Minecraft, for example. Any hardcore Minecraft fan can tell you that the original beta release of Minecraft is vastly different from modern Minecraft. But they are still both Minecraft. It was never re-released. The modern Minecraft isn't a sequel to classic beta Minecraft. It's still the same game. But now it's so different than it used to be that it's basically a bigger change than a lot of HD re-releases have seen. So does Minecraft version 1.8.3 count as a separate game from Minecraft 1.0? Consider this. You have a hammer. After many years of use, the handle snaps in half. So you just replace the handle, keep the original head. Then, a few years later, after more and more use, the head finally shatters. So, you replace the head. Is this the same hammer you had before? Maybe we should get into something more advanced, like a gaming PC. Let's say you buy a brand new gaming PC and it's super awesome. You put it all together with all the parts, and you love it. But as the years go by, you start noticing that you can't play new games on maximum graphics anymore. So, you start upgrading, piece by piece, over the years. You start with the motherboard, and that's a bad idea to start with the motherboard. <laughs> but you start with the graphics cards, and then the processor, and then the hard drives, and the RAM, and all. Piece by piece, you start rebuilding the computer. Eventually, 
everything has been replaced. You may even completely replace the case at some point, just moving the insides from your old computer into the new case. So after you've updated everything, after every part has been replaced, is it still the same computer it was? It's been slowly changing over the years, piece by piece, as you added new parts in. And now you have the leftover parts. You could still go back and put your old parts together into an older gaming PC. So are these two PCs now the same computer? Since after all, that was your original gaming PC forever ago, but your gaming PC has been changing. On and on, just changing. Until now, your gaming PC is this one. So have you completely copied your gaming PC? We can go even deeper with this. Let's talk about the human body. Every seven years, your body will have replaced every cell in its system. Which is very interesting to think about. It's all at a different rate. For instance, your skin cells will rejuvenate every few weeks or so. Your spine take the longest. Seven years. So after those seven years, your skin has replaced itself many, many times over, but your spine is just now getting to the point where it's completely replaced itself. So if you go back in time seven years and meet your previous self, will the universe end? <laughs> That's not what this is about. But if you do that, will you be meeting yourself or a previous version of you that is completely different? Are you still the you that you were seven years ago? 